People always ask me, what country has the best food? This documentary dives deep into Taiwan's culinary traditions from across the island, but kicking things off in the capital. So he starts with a big huge piece of dough that he puts a little bit of salt on top of, some oil, rubs that in, and then fills it with a ton of green onions and then rolls that up into a log, makes it into this long uh, kind of snake-like dough. It's a pretty simple mixture, but it's all about the technique that's making it and then the baking process is next. He gets all suited up to work with this extremely hot oven, so he puts on these like sheaths, these things to cover his arms, and then soaking wet gloves, and then puts his entire arm inside of the oven, which is a charcoal oven, and then sticks them to the side. It reminds me exactly of a tandoor oven, and it reminds me of kind of naan bread, but it's totally different with the sesame seeds with the green onions on the inside. So it's a meal in itself, or sometimes you can get a fried egg in it, but I'm gonna try it just uh, plain, fresh out of the oven. Alright, here is the final product. It feels nice and doughy on the outside. You can see a little crispy burnt sesame seeds there and all the green onions peeking out. And then on the bottom, nice and crispy. And it is like a really thick, doughy snack. So it's gonna be quite filling, I think. Let's try it out. It's fresh out of the oven and super hot still. Mm. It's really bouncy and a little bit chewy on the inside, but then the outside's got a nice crisp layer. The flavor is mainly just sesame seeds, a little bit of saltiness, and then of course the green onions. It almost tastes buttery on the inside, so I'm not sure if he's just using oil or if that was butter or something, but oh yeah, that is super satisfying. Fresh out of the oven, this is how you want to eat it. There's so many green onions inside, look at that. The inside part of that, it is so juicy from all those green onions. Mm. Mm. There's not much to it, but that's Taiwanese breakfast. Simple, but satisfying. Really delicious Xiaobing. Apparently there's only about 20 places left in Taipei that are doing it in the kind of tandoor oven.
Those two restaurants were just down the street from the Chiang Kai-shek Memorial Hall and uh, Liberty Square here in Taipei, one of my favorite places to hang out. It is about 11.30 now and getting super hot, but this is somewhere you have to check out when you're in Taipei. As many of you know, Taiwan is the place where I started my YouTube journey and uh, that was about seven years ago. So I hold it very close to my heart. Uh, it's a place that I love a lot and I thought that this would be a really good time to uh, introduce someone to you. Who's behind the camera? Hey guys. Okay, this is my girlfriend, Mink. Where are you from? Um, I'm from Thailand, Bangkok. A lot of you guys have been asking in the Malaysia series. so. We're here together in Taiwan. It's your first time here. Um, I like the food and it's quite hot, but compared to Bangkok, Taiwan is like, Taipei is not as crazy and busy as Bangkok, so. We're here on invite by the Ministry of Culture, as I mentioned, so we're gonna be filming some videos about the indigenous cuisine and culture. Nice to meet you. <laughs> Now, if you see a little Thai girl in the background, <laughs> you know who she is. <laughs> the square is actually set up for a performance that they're having soon, but uh, this is just one of my favorite places in Taipei. It's so beautiful. This is the National Theater behind me. The other building on the other side is the Concert Hall, National Concert Hall. So that was a little bit of what you can eat for breakfast here in Taipei, and now I wanna show you what you can eat at nighttime. Of course, the best place to eat at night in Taipei is the night market, so I've come to the Tonghua Night Market. Let's go eat some street food. This is the Tonghua Night Market, but it's also known as the Linjiang Street Night Market. It's in the very center of Taipei, Xinyi, on her station, so it's in a really good location, which makes it quite popular, and there's some very famous foods here. So I'm gonna go grab some snacks, some street food, and then end the night with some dessert. <laughs> First stop is for Shenzhen Mao, which is a fried and kind of steamed at the same time bun uh, stuffed with pork. Uh, they also sell pot stickers, but I just went with the Shenzhen Mao and look at that beauty. It looks super juicy on the inside and then a nice crispy bottom. They come in uh, bags of five for 65 Taiwan dollars. Oh, so good. A little bit salty on the inside. Once again, the flavor of green onion. It's super juicy, crispy on the bottom, and then the doughy wrapper has been saturated with all that porky goodness. Mm. Oh man, that is so good. Look how juicy that is. Yeah. These Shenzhen Bao are seriously juicy. They are packed full of juice, so you gotta be careful because when they're hot, uh, you could get some serious, uh, severe third degree burn. Oh man. It's so juicy, look at that. Yum. What do you think? First Taiwanese night market experience. It's like good. It? Mm. Juicy? Mm. Anything that can be considered a dumpling here in Taiwan, you're almost guaranteed that it's gonna be delicious. Man, I miss Taiwanese food.
My next stop is at this little restaurant that's selling kind of Taiwanese Western food and I ordered up the pork chop. So it's served on this uh, stone plate that's sizzling hot when it comes out. There's some noodles, which kind of look like pasta to be honest, and a fried egg and you can get beef, you can get chicken. I went with the pork chop and you can also choose what kind of sauce you want. So you can get a mushroom sauce or you can get like me, black pepper sauce, so go for a little cut there. Oh, it is sizzling hot. Look at that. Mm. Mm. It's actually really good. I usually don't go for this kind of food here. I usually stick with the traditional Taiwanese food. I've never tried um, this dish before in Taiwan. Believe it or not, it's quite popular to get these sizzling hot plates. Safe to call these noodles, or if I should call them pasta, or what? The flavor is all in that black pepper sauce. It's got a really nice kick to it. Actually, this is super good. I thought it wasn't gonna be good. I wish I would've tried this a long time ago. It's a nice, thin, pounded piece of pork, so it cuts through easily and it's still nice and juicy and tender. Let's try it with some of this fried egg they give it to you, like this. They don't even fry the egg, they just let the egg cook on the uh, hot plate like that. Oh, it's gonna be hot, I think. Oh, too hot. Oh, God. In Taiwan, they have a thing that they say you have Taiwanese dead tongue because the food always comes to the table sizzling hot like this, but this dish is exceptionally hot. All right, let's go. I'm gonna get my Taiwanese dead tongue back. Oh, mm. oh, oh, oh. oh good. I should have known Taiwanese people have a really good taste in food, so I should have tried this a long time ago because it's quite popular here in Taiwan. But uh, the concept just kind of always threw me off, eating like a steak with spaghetti all on a burning hot uh, plate. But let me tell you, it works. So good, actually. Wow. I'm the person who want to try this one, but you don't want to try it. And you're like, oh, I don't think so. Steak? I don't think it's good, babe. But then at first bite, he eats a lot more than me, like faster. So if you keep comparing it to me, this one. All right, turns out that's actually really delicious and I can highly recommend it. So I'm definitely going to be eating that more often here in Taiwan. <laughs> There's a tiny little push cart stall right in the heart of the Tonghua Night Market. He's serving a popular dessert. It's one of the most popular stands in the entire market. And it's a taro ball, so little balls of taro that he's frying and he kind of works them and works them in the oil. And uh, there's a 10 minute wait just to get these. So I place my order, waiting for him to finish cooking up my balls. Cooking up my balls. Okay. Yes, so I was a little bit mistaken. They make this dessert here in Taiwan with both taro and sweet potato. I think these ones are just sweet potato. And the technique is really cool. After they finish frying, he pumps them full of air. So each individual ball gets kind of squished down and then it fills up with air. And then this is the final product. And I don't think they have a name at that stall, but it is so packed, it's crazy. I think Taiwanese people just get in line if they see that there's a line. So let's find out if they're any good. They're super hot. It doesn't have much of a flavor, really. I don't think they've added anything to it. I think that's strictly sweet potato. It's a little bit creamy on the inside and airy, but it's really crunchy on the outside. It's not super sweet because they haven't added any sugar. It's just the natural sweetness from the sweet potato. Wow. 
I can't believe people are waiting so long for this. It's just like uh, fried air is what it kind of tastes like with a little hint of sweetness. Mm. It's all right, not my favorite. We're standing inside of like an arcade. It is absolutely crazy. Go. Oh no, it sucks. Look at him. Like that? Hold on, hold on. This way a little bit. This way a little bit. Yes. Oh, yes. Oh, 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 yes. Oh. <sighs> and I can see you can see. We arrived at about 6 a.m. and they've already unloaded a lot of the tuna. They've got these big cranes that they actually use to offload the tuna. And some of these things go up to 200 kgs. Now they are all just sitting in carts and they're waiting to be auctioned off. So the individual cart owner will take his whole cart over and then they'll auction each one off. We'll go check out the auction in a minute, but just checking out the overall area. There's also some other species. There's swordfish, there is mahi-mahi, a couple other different little things. And it is just really buzzing in here with activity, even though it's only 6 a.m. and so many tunas. And some of them are huge. The sound of a whistle, the auction has begun. They just unloaded all the carts and put all of the tuna on the floor. They're using these hooks to move them around and they're all marked. I'm not exactly sure what the markings mean. It's kind of like another world here where only the participants, the auctioneers and the fishermen really know what's going on. But uh, we are just enjoying the intense atmosphere in here and you can see all of the southern bluefin tuna behind me. I don't know, there's gotta be hundreds. It was like they flipped a switch in here and it got really chaotic. They were just dragging fish all over the place. They started by rolling out the scales and then all the tuna are separated, I believe, by the different fishermen's catch. They're weighing the tuna, most of them in the 60 kg range, but they can get much more than that. We actually did see one swordfish that was absolutely massive, probably around 200 kgs or even more and they're weighing them up first and then I believe they're gonna start uh, the bidding process of the auction. But one really unique thing to note is that they use this really interesting tool. Um, the buyers use it in order to check the fat content of the tuna. The higher the fat, 
content, the better the quality. So it's this really interesting tool that pulls out a little piece from the tail area and then they can check the content of the fat using their fingers, just feeling for how much fat is in there. This is kind of like Taiwan's Tsukiji market from Tokyo. It is just crazy in here. There's so many tuna. I feel So things have definitely calmed down in here. If there was one word to uh, describe this place, it would definitely be chaotic. That was just like 30 minutes of craziness. And the last step is to clean the tuna and uh, chop them up into pieces and take them away to the shops to be sold as seafood. That was really fun to watch and the atmosphere is just out of this world. Uh, you can get really up close and personal unlike the fish market in uh, Tokyo Tsukiji. Well now it's called Toyosu. But this place is definitely a really cool place to visit if you want to come down from Kaohsiung super early. I'm not gonna lie, it definitely doesn't smell too good in there, but seeing them pull that little bit of pink meat out is making me a little bit hungry. So we're gonna head down to the public market now, the Hua Chao market, where you can actually taste some of the seafood. <laughs> inside the Hua Chiao fish market now. In my opinion, this is Taiwan's best fish market. It's very tourist friendly and there is just a huge abundance and variety of seafoods, all kinds of colorful fish, parrot fish, all kinds of clams, different types of shrimp, mantis shrimp, octopus, uh, even stingray, you can really get it all here. And one of the best parts about this market is that you can pick your seafood from these uh, fish vendors and then take it to one of the numerous restaurants which line the outside of the market and they will cook it in your preferred method or whatever they recommend. So I think we're gonna do that later, but first of all, we wanna walk around and just take a look and try some of the little snacks that are available within the Hua Chiao fish market. So there is one little stall in this market that's really popular and they're selling fish cakes and the fish cakes are stuffed with a boiled egg and they're making them by hand so they've got the fish cake paste and then they just take the half or like a quarter of a, a, a boiled egg and then put it inside the fish paste directly and then they're just dropping that little almost like sausage oblong shaped uh, fish cake into the oil frying it up and then you can just order them one or as many as you want. I think we're just going to get one to try. So we've got our fish cakes here and they are actually double fried. I think in either two different types of oil or two different temperatures and the second uh, frying is for that exterior, that golden crispy exterior and there should be a piece of boiled egg on the inside. I think this is gonna be really hot but let me try to take a big bite. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. Mm. It's very simple. So it is seasoned with a little bit of salt and pepper and then she's just skewered them up for us. It's perfect little snack. Um, not much to it. It doesn't have a very fishy flavor and I haven't gotten that egg yet. You can see I gotta get one more bite to get to the egg. Oh yeah. Mm. That is nice. I like that little snack. That was a good fish cake. One of the best things about this market is that there's a lot of free samples so we're on a little bit of a sample hunt. So we spotted this stall that has samples of fish floss. He's got a big pile of it right here. You can see it's got this really unique texture. I don't know how to explain it, but almost like cotton candy or something. And I've got a little uh, cup of it, so let me try. Mm. Yeah, actually it's really good. It's not salty and it's got a very light seafood flavor. And it kind of melts in your mouth, 
but it's like cotton candy in the way that if you chew it, it gets harder. It's actually really good. So this is one of the most important ingredients or seafoods in all of Dongang, and this is the Sakura shrimp. So these things are actually very uh, limited. You can only really get them here in Dongang and one bay in Japan. So they're kind of rare, and these are, I think, dried, and you can just eat them like this. So let me try one out. Mm. Yeah. Actually, it's not what you think it's gonna be. It's actually very sweet. And then not really seafoody, I'm surprised, because usually dried seafood has a strong aroma, but it's not as bad. And then that shell is nice and crunchy. That's actually really, really good. So cool, too. Oh, I love those Sakura shrimp. They would go perfect with a beer. You could just eat them as is, nothing needed. And there's a lot of samples here, and people are just really friendly. There's one more thing we are hoping to sample. Okay, so this is another one of the uh, specialties of Dangang, and that is the tuna, the sakura shrimp, and then this, which is the oil fish roe. So it's a deep sea fish, and it's different than mullet roe, uh, which is also very popular in Taiwan, and this is more rare, more unique, and they have to do a long process of drying and curing and washing the roe, and she put a little bit of mayonnaise on the top, and. I'm not sure if I'm gonna like this or not because I'm usually not a fan of the mullet, but I've never tried the oil fish roe. Mm. Oh, it's actually not nearly as salty as I thought it was going to be. So these are all the different uh, egg sacks and we just tried the marlin, the oil fish, and the tuna and not as strong a flavor as I was expecting. I think I like the oil fish one the most, but uh, I thought I was eating the oil fish one the first time, but it was actually the second. Really cool. So there's a few sashimi sushi stalls within the market and they have all the tuna laying out front in their display case and it looks incredible. So you can see the different cuts of the tuna. Here is the extra fatty belly. This is the fatty belly and then it just goes down the line, medium, and then a couple other different types of fish too. I think we're gonna order up some of the lean tuna and then of course some of the fatty belly. This just looks so good. So there's a little uh, counter seating that you can sit at and you can spend your whole bank account here if you want. I just asked them how much one of the big chunks of the otoro, the fatty tuna, was and it was 33,000 Taiwan dollars. So that's like well over a thousand US dollars. We're not getting that. We just got, I think around uh, 700 Taiwan dollars worth of tuna and we've got a little bit of green tea while we wait. It just looks beautiful. The presentation is incredible. We got 10 pieces of the akami, the back of the tuna. This is the Taiwan tuna, the same tuna we saw this morning. And this was 300 Taiwan dollars for 10 pieces of the akami. And then we got two pieces of the otoro, the fatty tuna. And this was 170 per piece, so 340 for just two pieces versus 300 for all of these. And I'm gonna go in for a piece of the akami first. So just look at the coloration there, it's so rich, dark red. And I'm just gonna go for a little bit of wasabi here. Put a tiny bit of wasabi on the top. And then a dip in the soy sauce too. Mm. Oh man, that is so good. If that is the lean tuna, I can't imagine 
how soft and tender that fatty piece is going to be because it just completely melts in your mouth. It's so soft, you really don't even need teeth to eat it. A little uh, spicy hit of wasabi and then a little bit of saltiness from the soy sauce, but really it's all about that natural tuna flavor. So fresh, they actually aged the tuna before serving a sashimi, but I mean the port's right outside, so it didn't have to travel very far, and that is just really, really high quality stuff. All right, the time has come. We're gonna try the fatty tuna now. I'm gonna go really light on the wasabi, and you can see that she's actually scored it. So there's these little cuts in there, and this has been a special experience watching the tuna come fresh off the boats and be auctioned off this morning, and now just sitting just a uh, few steps away from where they were bringing the tuna in and eating some of this fresh, raw sashimi tuna, and it is just blowing my mind. All right, time to try the fatty piece. Wow. 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 <laughs> that is absolutely on another level. It goes in a solid, and as soon as it hits the warmth of your tongue, it completely disintegrates because the fat content is just so high in there. It is marbled all throughout the muscle that it just starts melting and then the muscle just starts falling apart and it coats your mouth in a film and then you can taste that fresh tuna underneath that film of fat on your mouth. I, it's hard to explain but that is like an experience more than just a taste. It is so good and we have eaten at some of the best sushi restaurants in the world and I would argue that this is just on par with those places. That was incredibly good. That was well, well, well worth the price. Incredibly delicious. And we are not full because that was just a little couple pieces. Uh, we're gonna pick out a fish in order to have uh, one of the restaurants cook up for us. And we're gonna get like a Taiwanese style meal now. Check out all these crabs, like a crab army. Oh, please, you get So we picked this stall to buy our fish from. She's got a complete spread of different things, all different shapes and sizes. Look at this colorful blue parrot fish here. But we went with one of these little red snappers. So it was 180 for one of those. And we will probably get that steamed at the restaurant. After an early morning at the fish auction and a long day walking around the market and sampling all those delicious foods, I think a beer is in order. Oh, that is so good. It is way too hot. So here's our first dish. It's the clams. This is something I always order. I love this dish. So it's stir fried clams with um, some sauce, some basil, some onions, there's some ginger in there. And uh, just make sure when you're at these places, don't eat the clams that uh, don't open up. So like ones like this that are still closed because either they weren't healthy or they're just not cooked fully. But these ones are, this one here is okay. Take a little bit of basil, some ginger, onion, and let's try that. Mm. That is always my favorite. The basil's a little overpowering. It's very earthy and a little bit floral, and then strong ginger flavor. Those clams are nice and fresh. Oh, just look at this. It's just swimming in that sauce which is not uh, an overpowering sauce, but it just saturates those clams. They just get coated in it. Those are kind of big guys too, look at that. It's a pretty big clam. What's going on here? It's got like antennas or something. Yum. So here's our fish. We had it steamed. It's topped in a ton of green onions, ginger, a little bit of chilies, and then it's swimming in a nice thin sauce. And these are one of my favorite ingredients when you eat at these seafood restaurants in Taiwan. These are, I believe they're called gooseberries and they've got a nice kind of uh, citrusy flavor. So I'm gonna go in right for the eyeball. No, I'm just kidding. I'm gonna go for some of the meat on the side. The texture it takes on from being steamed is really unique. I think this one may have been uh, over steamed because it's a little bit mushy and there's actually not a whole lot of flavor going on there. But I do like it with the ginger and then that sauce is a little bit uh, sour and a little bit of soy sauce flavor. But I think it may be overcooked actually. You grab a little bit more meat. You can see it's a, a little bit mushy. I'm gonna try it with one of these gooseberries. Oops, oops. Here we go. Mm. 
Yeah. That berry is just a burst of flavor. Unfortunately, the meat's a little bit too soft for my legging. Next up is the shrimp. They look like they've been sauteed in some spicy sauce with some onions. And don't worry, I have sanitized and washed my hands, but I'm gonna break this open with my hand. Wow, that is smoking hot. Woo. All right, let me take the rest of the shell off. Shrimp is disassembled, but this definitely needs to get dipped in that sauce. And let's give that a try. Oh, that is awesome. Oh, those are cooked perfectly. Still nice and firm, and that sauce has got a little bit of a kick to it. It's a little bit kind of tangy, and then I just love the natural flavor of the shrimp. And you can take the head and kind of suck out some of those juices. Mm. This is a good seafood meal. I am a little bit disappointed because this fish is kind of flavorless, but never forget to flip your fish over when you're done on one side. It's kind of a tricky task. Oh no, oh my god. Well, that works, right? Fall off the boat. <laughs> yeah, fall off the boat. That's what happens when it's over-steamed. I am so excited to be back here. This place I filmed about five years ago. It's just a little stall. It's not even really a stall. He's just set up on the pavement here, right on the road. Just a couple little chairs and he's selling almond tea, but he does it with a unique ingredient. He uses the egg yolk, so a raw egg yolk. You can see it's completely changed the color of this almond tea to a bright yellow. There's a little couple pieces of egg yolk floating in there and uh, served in this metal cup here. Super, super hot, let's try it out. And the smell is so fragrant, it's like fruity and nutty at the same time. It's such a complex flavor, even though it's a simple drink, it's really hard to describe. You need to try this in Taiwan. I, it doesn't taste like almonds. If you just eat almonds, no, it's not the same taste. It's like a really strong, fruity, flavor and this place is doing it in such a traditional way like I said right on the road right on the pavement super cool oh, it's so creamy and delicious yeah. this spot is only open early in the morning till about 10 a.m. it's right on the edge of the market I'm gonna go in and check the market out here shortly and they've been here on the side of the road for 82 years selling just almond tea uh, that is just so cool. And cooking it on charcoal too. Wow. I'm directly inside of Jai's East Market and I've come to a really popular stall that's serving beef soup. So they have a massive cauldron and they've just started packing the broth full of uh, tripe and skin and uh, beef lag and all kinds of different cuts of uh, the cow. And you can order it with all the different intestinal cuts like liver, kidney, uh, intestines, but you can also just order the beef meat and it's all, uh, the flavor is gonna be coming all from that broth which has just been simmering away all morning with all of that fatty, beefy cuts of meat. And I just love the huge cauldron here. So I'm gonna sit down with all the locals and order myself up a beef soup. They just keep packing and packing and packing that cauldron full of different cuts of the cow. And she's got a little like kind of bamboo weaved basket 
that she puts whatever cuts you order so you can order anything you want and then just blanches it quickly in the boiling soup and then served uh, in the bowl with a little bit of ginger. So I ordered mine with just the beef. No uh, intestines because, you know, it's only about 8 a.m. right now, so <laughs> I felt like just having beef. And look at all of that. They really go generously. And uh, a little bit of ginger in there, as I said. Go for a little dip in this sauce over here. Two types of sauce. It looks like a red and brown sauce. Let's try that. Yum. Yum. It's really beefy. I could definitely taste the ginger in there and the beef is nice and soft. The sauce is a little bit sweet and a little bit spicy, but it's just really, really beefy. And look at how much they give me. That is crazy. Very, very generous. Go for a little less sauce this time so I can taste the natural flavor. Yeah. This is a popular breakfast item here in Jai, especially with the older folks. They like to have this soup. And they close down only about uh, 11 a.m. So it's only open in the morning. Yum, that is good. Wow. Here in Taiwan, simplicity is king. High quality ingredients, simple flavors. That's really what it's all about here. There is so much to eat here in the Jai East Market. This is my favorite traditional market in all of Taiwan. So just around the corner from the beef soup stall is a famous uh, fried meat roll. To make the meat roll, they start with a really thin piece of, I believe it's the diaphragm. It's basically a white piece of fat. It's completely translucent. It's super thin. And they fill it full of the meat mixture. It looks like there's some veggies in there as well. And then it's rolled up like a big spring roll. Then it's breaded and dropped into the hot oil and fried up into this huge log. Super popular. There's a big line, so I'm gonna jump in line and order myself up one of these meat rolls. So this is the final product all chopped up. It's absolutely huge. And I think it's to be taken home most of the time and eaten with a little bit of sauce, but I'm just gonna sample it now as is fresh out of the fryer. I think it's gonna be really hot. And I can see a couple little carrots and maybe some green onions, some other veggies in there as well. And then that, that uh, diaphragm has been completely fried to a crisp on the outside. Oh wow. That is really good. It's juicy. Super, super juicy. And just a thin, crunchy layer on the outside, but the inside's got a nice bouncy texture. Almost like a fish cake texture. Mmm. It's actually full of flavor. That'd be really good with the beer and some ketchup or something. <laughs> but yeah, there's definitely some onions in there as well too. Besides really good food to eat here at the market, you can also find all the ingredients to prepare any kind of Taiwanese dish here at the Jai East Market. This, as I said, is my favorite traditional market in Taiwan. It feels like time stopped here hundreds of years ago and things have not changed. It's got this authentic feel that uh, I find is missing in a lot of other markets here in Taiwan. I always love coming here. It really is like nostalgic to me now. I love this place. Mm -hmm. 
this next stop, it's my first time to come to this particular shop, but it's a very historical shop. It's been around here in Jai for over a hundred years, if you can believe it. And they specialize in star fruit juice. So this is it right here, star fruit juice. And you can see she's giving me it with a fork because there's actually some pieces of star fruit down at the bottom. But let me just try some of the juice by itself first. Lots of ice in there too. It's really not what I was expecting. I only, I think, had starfruit juice once before. It's kind of like a plum juice. It reminds me of plum. It's a really light sweetness and a really light saltiness at the same time. And it almost has like a kind of a vegetable-y flavor, if that makes any sense. The closest thing I can compare it to is plum. Mm. But it is really refreshing. Okay, so what I'm supposed to do, though, is grab some of the starfruit at the bottom. It's a really big cup and they're hiding down there. Okay, there we go. If I can grab that, and you can see the star fruit there. I think it's been pickled. Let me try that. Mmm. It tastes just like a sweet plum. Mmm. That is really delicious. A little bit sweet, for sure. Super refreshing. Over a hundred years. That's what I love about Jai. There's so much history here. There's so many shops that have just been around and not affected by modern development. Mm. Mm -hmm. You can see that there's tons of star fruit in the bottom there. It's not a common fruit, at least uh, not for me. I never eat star fruit, so it's really interesting flavor. And there's also a plum in there. Let me try that. Mm -hmm. oh, it's kind of hard. Mm, a little bit sour. Yep. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's actually really good with it. Wow, so cool. There's a man set up on the corner with a stall and he's selling something called Meiatzen, which is a traditional, very old school style Taiwanese dessert. So it really reminds me of Indonesian martabak. It's basically a batter that he fries, big pancake. You can order the salty kind, which comes with uh, green onions and different things, but you can also order sweet versions. He's got red bean, he's got uh, peanut, which I went for. So this is the peanut. I think there's a little bit of sugar in there as well. And you can see that it's got that spongy texture to it. I think that might be partly fermented batter because you can see the little bubbles forming in that batter. And like I said, reminds me exactly of Mardabak, but this is actually the first time I'm gonna try it here in Taiwan. Let's try it. Mm. Yeah. Oh, it's so good. It is quite sweet though. It's creamy on the inside. So I think, I'm not sure if it's just peanuts or something else he added in there, but it's a little bit creamy and I can definitely taste a strong peanut flavor. It kinda tastes like peanut butter toast, but not crunchy or crispy toast. Instead, really soft, spongy bread. It's like a sponge cake on the outside is how I'd describe it. Oh man, that is really good. Mm -hmm. Just in this little stall right here. So cool. I rarely ever see someone selling this street snack here in Taiwan. It's really only this guy that I've seen selling it on the corner here in Jai, and he's been doing it for 60 years. Again, I just love that uh, Jai people really hold on to their uh, historic culture and really keep their food culture alive. Mm, it's awesome too. Try it out. Well, it wouldn't be a Jai food tour without chicken rice. Well, that's what they call it here, but it's actually turkey rice. If you know anything about Jai, it's turkey rice is its namesake. Famous all across Jai, you can find tons of turkey rice restaurants, and I'm just gonna pop into a local one, show you guys what it's all about. Let's go.
the chicken rice is not just meant to be eaten by itself. You usually order a lot of different side dishes with it. And like I said, this is Jai's namesake. This is why a lot of people come to Jai. There's going to be hundreds, if not thousands, of these chicken rice restaurants in Jai. But I keep calling it chicken rice. It's really using turkey. This is the turkey right here, turkey rice. So very simple, but it's all about the juice that they put on top at the very end. And bed of rice served also with a pickled radish, this nice yellow looking radish. Like I said though, you gotta eat it with lots of things. So I've got a miso soup over here. It's a tofu miso soup. Back here I've got some just blanched cabbage, a little bit of veggies in there. And then this is uh, another popular Taiwanese side dish. It's uh, bamboo shoots with a little bit of mayonnaise on top. So, like I said, you dig in, you have lots of different things. The rice is just not plain here. It's with turkey, so let's dig in. Not bad. It's got a really fresh turkey flavor. And then the juice completely soaks into the rice. So that's where a lot of the flavor is coming from. Mm. It's not salty, it's just very natural. But if you want to have a little salty, you can have a bite of the radish. Yeah, that's always really salty. Mm. Let's try it with some side dishes. As I was saying earlier, very simple flavors here in Taiwan. Just some blanched cabbage. Very healthy though, I love it. Mm. This is Jai food. To be honest, not a huge fan of the mayonnaise, but uh, let's try it. Some bamboo shoots. Yeah. It's weird. <laughs> but the turkey rice makes everything good. Chase that with a little bit of tofu miso soup. Same as a Japanese miso soup. And this is why everyone comes to Jai for these incredible flavors, especially the turkey rice. But there's tons of other foods like you saw me try in this video. And I've made tons of other videos here which you can go check out. It's so reminiscent for me to come back and eat these Jai famous foods. I love this city so much. The people and the food and the culture is some of the most authentic and friendliest and delicious in the entire world. And make sure you come check out Jai if you come to Taiwan. You can feel it in the air that the Dragon Boat Festival is here. The mood has changed and things are particularly festive feeling. And at markets like this one I'm at right now, you can find all the necessary ingredients for making the jongze. You can find the bamboo leaves, which are used to wrap the dumplings inside of. You can find all the different fillings, particularly the duck eggs. You can find the rice, of course the rice, that's the most important ingredient of all. And one other thing you can see a lot of here is these bundles of plants, particularly calamus, wormwood, a couple other things, and these are used traditionally to hang in front of the doors of people's houses in order to ward off evil spirits. So it's a superstitious tradition going back centuries. And you can also buy the jongses here. They're pretty much everywhere you look, uncooked and cooked, hanging in bundles, and people are buying them like hotcakes. But we're not going to try the jongses here. We're gonna try out some of the famous restaurants. But first, let's go see exactly how these jongses are made. This shop is serving takeaway uncooked jongses. They're making them all by hand and we were lucky to see them doing it right here on the side of the street. So they start with the bamboo leaves, two bamboo leaves. They form it into a cone shape and then fill it with uncooked glutinous rice. The simplest form of the jongses is with peanuts. So they put a little bit of peanuts in, close up the bamboo leaves and then tie it up with some rope and then they form it into these bundles of about 10 or so. You can also get it with more ingredients, more complex ingredients. They serve it with meat, 
and mushrooms and they'll use actually a different type of bamboo leaves. I think it's an older bamboo tree and it's got a different color to it so they can tell the difference between the peanuts only and the meat kind. This is really cool but they're not cooking them here. This is just for you to take home and cook on your own. So we need to go check out how they actually cook these. Okay. Yes. <laughs> this is, thank you. How, how do we cook it? Cook okay. it? No, just eat. This one's already yep, cooked. Oh, okay. Oh, you good. finish. This is peanut one. Okay. Peanut, okay. okay. Yeah. And uh, this is sweet soy sauce. This spot is making thousands of these jongses. They have at least 10 of these massive pots that have been boiling them away for probably a couple hours. And they're all wrapped up in bundles of maybe 10 or 20. And they have to hook them and pull them out of the water. Um, I'm pretty sure it's just plain water. There may be a little bit of salt that they're boiling in and then they're hanging them up on these racks in the bundles and a couple fans on them to let them dry with the air and the sun um, maybe for a few more hours before they're totally ready to eat. But this is like a factory. It is crazy the amount of jongs that they're making here. So those were the ones that were finished cooking. These are the ones that need to be cooked. And there is more, thousands more. Wow, I can't believe how many they're really cooking. Crazy. After seeing us filming, they would not let us leave without a couple Jongses. Everyone is just extra friendly because of the Dragon Boat Festival. That was such a cool place. Historically and superstitiously, the fifth day of the fifth lunar month was regarded as a very unlucky day. And a lot of the celebrations and traditions of Dragon Boat Festival actually derive from that unluckiness. And Sabrina and I have definitely experienced it today because we naively assumed coming down here to Tainan that all of the Jungzu restaurants were gonna be open for business because it's Dragon Boat Festival and you eat Jungzu in Dragon Boat Festival, but they were all closed because of the holiday. Luckily, this one was opened. It's been open since 1872. It's the oldest Jungzu restaurant, but when we got here, they were sold out. We had to beg them for one Jungzu. Luckily, they had some more out back. We were able to do a little bit of convincing and we got their famous Jungzu right here. It's the Eight Treasures Jungzu. It has eight ingredients in it, so it has Scallops, fish, sakura shrimp, mushrooms, meat, chestnuts, and rice. And then you can see it's got this very thin sauce, which is uncommon. Usually they give you a very thick sauce. It's in that pyramid shape. It is really beautiful. And I'm so happy they were able to give us one jongzu. So let's dig into their famous eight treasures jongzu. So I can actually see some of the ingredients from the outside. I can see the duck egg yolk on top, salted. And then I think this is a scallop there. This is either the mushroom or the chestnut, and that's the other one. And then you can also see the sakura shrimp over here. I'm just gonna go in for one of these corners here, which might not actually have very much, and really get a flavor of that sauce. Looks like there's a little bit of meat inside. Let's try that. Mm. Hold that, yum. The rice is glutinous rice, so it's got a very chewy, kind of sticky texture to it. 
there was a little bit of meat in there, but the flavor is mainly coming from the sauce, which is like a thinned out, watered down soy sauce. Let's dig in and get some more of these ingredients. This is definitely a deluxe Jungza. Usually they just come with very simple ingredients, but this one has all kinds of different things. I've got the mushroom here, some rice. Let's try. Mm. This is really just comfort food at its finest. It's not very strong in flavor, it's very simple actually, but it's really filling and it's really just home cooked tasting. Mm. The salted duck yolk is always one of my favorite ingredients. I've got that right here and it also looks like a big piece of meat. Man, this thing is hearty. Mm. Oh yeah. That's the best bite. You get a little bit of seafoody flavor going on in there. There's scallops, there's all kinds of deluxe ingredients. And this is definitely reflected in the price, which is a hundred Taiwan dollars. This time of year, everywhere you look, there is traditions and celebrations going on like this one. So cool to watch. their two top menu items. This one is the meat jiangzi rou zhong, and then this one is the vegetable jiangzi cai zhong, but this one is actually just with peanuts. You can actually see the peanuts there, and then they've actually covered it in a very thick sauce, contrary to the last place, which had a very thin sauce. And then on the peanut one, they put quite a bit of crushed peanuts around the outside. The meat one, same, but without the crushed peanuts. They both look really good and these are the most typical types of jongses that you will see commonly found around Dragon Boat Festival. Let's dig in. Let's start with the peanut one. I'm gonna make sure I get some of those peanuts that are inside with lots of sauce, but also some of the crushed peanuts over here. Let's try. Mm. That is completely different, wow. Very simple in flavor, served hot and fresh. That peanut, crushed peanuts, has a little bit of sugar, I think, in it too, because this one's actually got a little bit of a sweetness, but it's very dense with the glutinous, sticky rice. Let's try the meat one. This one's the real classic, like the OG of Jiangzi's. The pork Jiangzi, you can see the fatty chunks of pork there, all that rice. That completely envelops your mouth. It's so gooey, it kind of sticks to the top of your mouth. And I, weirdly enough, am reminded of turkey dinner back home in Canada. I think it's because of that sauce is almost gravy-like. Both really good, but I gotta give it up for the pork johns, uh, the OG, so good. Oh, it looks like there might even be some mushrooms in there. Look at that. We've come down to the Anping Canal here in Tainan City. This is where the Dragon Boat races take place annually. It's the international Dragon Boat race, but of course this year there's no international participants. And the reason why they do these Dragon Boat races is to honor the famous poet Chu Yuan. So a long time ago, he actually attempted to commit suicide by jumping into a lake and drowning himself. And the villagers adored him so much that they took the dragon boats out racing as fast as they could to get to him and save him. Unfortunately, they didn't save him and he did drown and die. And then in order to save his body because they couldn't find his body, they actually threw the Jongses in the water to distract the fish 
So it's a little bit of a morbid story, but now we have Dragon Boat Festival. We're gonna hang out here for the day, check out some of the races, check out some of the things going on. I'm really excited to see these races. <laughs> We just finished watching some of the races. That was really exhilarating. When they're about halfway through, they are cruising. They get going so fast. They have different types of boats. Some of the boats are smaller, and some of them are bigger with the big dragon heads on the front. And then sometimes they'll race two teams or three teams. We watched a couple races, but there's about uh, an hour or two interval between races, and then they'll do a couple races at a time. Despite the heat, there's still a lot of crowds here. It is smoking hot. There's a bunch of stalls also set up selling different things, especially a lot of street food. I think we're gonna go take a peek at those now. So there's one thing I could not leave without trying, and it is this crazy looking swinging pendulum of meat. It's this traditional Aboriginal style barbecue. He's got uh, pork belly, sausages on there, a couple pork chops. It's all cooking on wood fire, and he just keeps spinning and turning this thing, and this has gotta be one of the biggest grills I've ever seen. It's just suspended with this system that he can raise and lower in case uh, it's finished cooking or he needs to get it close to the flames. But wow, that is just crazy looking. Swinging pendulum of meat. <laughs> Besides just the pork belly, they have the entire pig going over here too, crispy style over wood fire. You can find some seriously crazy food setups around Dragon Boat Festival. So crazy. So they serve it up very simple, just uh, grilled on the barbecue and then with sliced up garlic like this, just raw garlic. And you can see there's little bits of burnt pieces and it's pretty fatty but it's also quite lean uh, let's try it out with some garlic here oh, man. That is so good. it's just infused with the smoke the fat melts in your mouth but you still get a little bit almost like a jerkiness from the lean meat it's got a slight bitterness from the little burnt pieces i love it this way aboriginal style and what a cool setup too mm. with the garlic that's strong. Yum. It's really only typical to find these guys serving the Aboriginal style pork on the big grill like this at festivals. And we just couldn't pass up. We had to film it. It's just such a cool setup. Uh, I don't think we'll try the full pig. That's a little bit too much of a pork overload. I'm fine with just the uh, Aboriginal style barbecue pork belly.
So in this little room here, she's got the noodle. It's thick right now, but it's going to be thin when they're finished. So she's stretching it out between these two wooden sticks and it's all about the technique and she's super fast. The floor here is completely covered in flour. So they keep uh, putting the flour on the noodles to prevent it from sticking together. And she's just barefoot in here with a ton of flour on the floor. And then they're going to take it outside to uh, stretch it out to become very thin mian shin, the really thin noodles and dry it under the sun. But this is just like the first step here. It's a really cool process and they're doing it completely traditional all by hand, of course. This factory is housed in a traditional Taiwanese home. This is called a San He Yen, which means like a three part compound. So multiple generations of the family will live here. And you can see up here, this wood has these holes in it. So I'm imagining they're going to bring the noodles out and string them up with the wooden poles. So they brought the noodles outside now and she's pulling them and hand stretching them until they're the desired thinness and it's almost like a dance. She keeps going back and forth making sure to pull them but not too much as to break them and they're becoming super, super thin. And then the second process is to hang them up, as I said, on these uh, wooden beams here and let them dry underneath the sun and the wind and you can just see they are so thin ultra thin and this place is gonna just fill up with noodles here. Watching them make the noodles here is like stepping back in time. Of course, they're making them handmade, but making them here at the San He Yen, this traditional Taiwanese brick home, just completes the traditional feel. It feels so authentic. This is not set up. This is not an attraction. There's no tourists here. This is just the factory, the way that they're doing it for four generations at the shop. And it's really particular the way they have to do it. They need to be always watching it because it depends on the weather. If it's too hot, the sun's too strong, they might dry out faster so they could crack. Or if it's too windy, they might all tangle up together. So they're really careful to watch the noodles and make sure they're drying properly. I'm gonna head into Lukang now, the town, and try out these noodles for myself. This was so cool to see how they're made, but let's go taste them. This is the spot to try the Mian Xian noodles here in Lukang. It is absolutely packed with locals. And this is the dish. So you can see it is an extremely thick noodle soup. It's thickened with starch. There's chunks of pork in there. A little bit of cilantro on top and you can see all that beautiful, beautiful thin noodles. 
but you gotta load this up with some of the toppings. So there is some vinegar on the table, black vinegar here, so go generous with that. And also some chili sauce as well. And then give that a little bit of a mix. Oh, it smells so good of vinegar. Let's try out some of these famous noodles. Mm. Whoa. It's almost like you can't even feel the noodles at all because the soup is so thick, it kind of blends in with the noodles. It's like a paste almost. And noodles, so thin obviously. Uh, the flavor is mainly coming from that chili and vinegar that I put in there. Let me try to find a piece of pork in there. Oh yeah, you can see a nice piece of pork. It looks like it maybe was fried too. The texture is extreme. Super, super sloppy, goopy noodles. But wow, that is good. Addicting. Just the first stop here in Lukang because there's a lot to try. Mm -hmm. You can't even eat this with chopsticks. Only spoons. These are the most slurpable noodles. It's like eating soup with no noodles because the noodles just blend in with that thick broth. Mm. Amazing with the vinegar and such a cool thing to see how they're making these noodles and then come to this restaurant and see just how popular they really are. And that's the reason you're able to keep those traditions alive is because people still like to eat it. You can see just how popular it is. They've got two massive cauldrons of the noodles and uh, the customers just keep coming and they keep cooking them. And that was absolutely delicious, so good. So this is Lukong Old Street. It's one of many old streets, as they call them here in Taiwan. Basically just these uh, old architectural streets here in Taiwan, but this one in Lukong is one of the oldest, and it's one of the nicest, uh, well-kept ones I've ever seen. So you've got all this uh, old red brick. There's ancient Chinese architecture, and uh, they've got the Chinese lanterns hanging too. It's quite a busy place and it's just full of touristy things nowadays, but still the architecture is incredible. I just popped into one of the old stores along Lukang's old street and this shop is just absolutely beautiful on the inside. All the original woodwork and it's been painted in these beautiful colors and this shop is selling uh, different drinks and different desserts. So I went with something I've never tried before. This is wheat roasted flour tea and it's iced and it looks like there's some puffed rice on top. So I guess it's roasted wheat flour and then it's kind of just like brewed into a tea. Let me just try this. Mm. Oh, that's refreshing. Really nutty. Kind of reminds me of rice milk mijiang. You can taste a little bit of sesame in there too. And then the uh, rice puffs have become saturated so they completely fall apart in your mouth. What a cool shop though. Incredibly beautiful. Amazing place to take pictures. Mm. A good drink too. The owner just told me he calls this a Taiwanese cappuccino. <laughs> it is really nice and thick. It's almost milky, but it's just made with that roasted wheat. This place is worth uh, just stopping in no matter what you order, just because the beauty of the shop is incredible. My owner wants to show me something here. Look at this. So he actually makes these himself. And he's been to France, a bunch of different countries to teach people how to make these figurines. Wow. And Whoa, this is intricate. He can take the hat off. He's got a little beard on there. Wow, and it's all handmade. He does these himself. Very cool. Hey. Oh. So the owner was just telling us that some of the buildings along Lu Kong's old street are over 400 years old. And he's got these posters up on the wall in this shop that are about 100 years old from Shanghai. He bought this building and renovated it about 40 years ago. It's just so cool. I love all this beautiful painting and all the woodwork in here. So cool.
Wow, that is the coolest shop ever. And you can really feel the tradition here at Lukong from seeing those uh, handmade noodles to walking along the street and hearing about the history here. It's uh, really a place where you can feel the traditions of Taiwan. I've come to this little stall that's selling a unique street food that I've never seen before, but it's popular here in Lukong. It's a taro cake. So basically he takes this little cup, lines the bottom with some shredded taro, and then a little bit of pork on the inside, and then tops it with some more taro. So it's like a little saucer. And then they steam them, and that's it. So it's just steamed taro with pork on the inside. I've never seen this in Taiwan before, but it's, like I said, really popular here in Lukong. So I'm gonna order one up, try it out. Here's the final result. It uh, looks quite interesting. I've never seen anything quite like this. And she also put a sauce on it. Looks like a sweet and maybe a little bit spicy sauce. So look at all that purple taro in there. That is really unique. And there's some pork on the inside. Let's try. That's unique. The texture on the outside is like a, almost like a potato and then uh, the inside's nice and porky. It uh, reminds me of almost a Taiwanese meatball, but the texture is really unique. It's kind of like a dumpling, but the wrapper is taro. Mm. Yeah, not my favorite, but it's pretty good. Sauce is a little bit sweet. A popular sweet here in Lukong is known as cow's tongue cake. So this is it right here. It's all about the shape. There's no beef in it whatsoever. It's just a sugar filled pan fried uh, dough. And you can see they've got all the fresh ones that are just uh, cooking here. And it smells really good. Simple, but uh, really interesting name, cow's tongue, just because of the shape, long and uh, oval shape. fresh and hot off the pan. Does it look like a cow tongue? <laughs> I think it does. <laughs> Let's open it up. There's not actually just sugar inside, but it's like a wheat sugar. Oh, it is seriously hot. Let's try that out. Nice and flaky. Mm. Mm -hmm. Well, it's pretty dry. I mean, it's not very sweet. Actually, it's really dry. <laughs> There's not a whole lot of flavor, but it's nice and flaky on the outside. And, uh, a little sweet, but nothing much else. Mm. Not the best dessert I've ever had in Taiwan, but uh, still cool. Mm -hmm. Now it looks like a dunk. I've just popped into Lukang's most famous temple. This is the Matsu Temple here in Lukang. It's right at the end of the old street and it is extremely intricate and beautiful, just like every temple here in Taiwan. Always peaceful to come here and just take a little walk around, uh, you know, cool off a little bit in the shade and just uh, 
enjoy the beauty of these temples. I love temple hopping here in Taiwan. It's one of my favorite things to do. You've got to check out at least a couple on your trip here. Directly outside of the temple, there is a seafood restaurant that sells, among other things, oyster omelets. They're famous for their oyster omelet. It's pretty Taiwanese to have the temple right beside the oyster omelet restaurant. And it's even more Taiwanese to have the family mart inside of the temple. So I'm gonna order up myself a oyster omelet. Very classic Taiwanese street food, the oyster omelet. Just a fried egg with some oysters and then some lettuce and a lot of starch batter. So it's got this really uh, gooey texture from the starch. And then this place tops it with two different types of sauce. It looks like a red sauce and a brown sauce. <laughs> Probably spicy and sweet. And I'll kind of cut this in half. You can see that plump, beautiful, fresh oyster. Lukong is very close to the coast, the west coast of Taiwan. And then you can also see that kind of gooey texture from the starch, and there are a lot of oysters in there. Look at that. Oh, go for a dip. It's all about that goopy texture. Wow. Let's try that. Mm. It's a really interesting texture. It's something you're gonna have to get used to if you come to Taiwan, because it definitely caught me off guard when I first came here. There's a lot of these interesting kind of gooey textures. I don't want to call it snotty, but it definitely is kind of a snotty texture. The oyster though, super fresh, very close to the coast here. And you get a little fresh crunch from the uh, lettuce in there as well. This place has two sauces. So you've got the red sauce, which is almost like a little tangy ketchup-y, and then the brown sauce, which is a lot sweeter. It's balanced nicely. It's so good. That's one of the better oyster omelets I've ever had. It feels surreal to be back here riding MRT again. I've just come to Chiang Kai-shek station and this is uh, my first stop today for some Taiwanese breakfast. So this is the first stop for breakfast today and I've come for a classic Taiwanese breakfast and that usually consists of soy milk. You can get it uh, sweet or salty. I ordered mine sweet and I also ordered it with uh, Taiwan's famous Xiaolong Bao, the soup dumplings. So the filling is just pork but uh, one interesting thing is that they use the pork fat that uh, renders when it's steamed and then creates the soup inside and it's all about the folds and uh, she's super fat. Another extremely popular Taiwanese breakfast item is the yo tiao. It's kind of like, it almost looks like a churro, but basically it's just a fried cruller. And the way that he makes it is really unique. He stretches out the dough into two thin long strips and then uses a chopstick to press them together and then dunks them into the hot oil until they're golden crispy and it's perfect with soy milk. So I'm still waiting for my Xiaolong Bao, but this is probably the most typical Taiwanese breakfast that I can think of anyway. It's the soy milk, and as I mentioned, I ordered the sweet, so there's quite a bit of sugar in it. You can also get the cold version, but I ordered the hot version. It comes in a bowl like this, and then yo tiao, which is just like a fried cruller, I guess. It's really just dough that's been fried, but what's great about eating these together is going for a little dip with the yo tiao in the soy milk. Oh, I miss this so much. It's so simple, but it's like nostalgic for me. 
It's been seven years since I moved to Taiwan, and then I haven't been back since the beginning of the pandemic. This is what I miss so much. Well, there's a lot of things I miss, to be honest. Okay, let's try the Xiaolong Bao now. You can't have Xiaolong Bao without the sauce, so start with uh, some Julian ginger, like this, and then uh, the owner just told me that I should put a uh, little bit of chili oil. Put a little, two scoops of that. And then some of this one, which I'm guessing is soy. And then this, which is gotta be vinegar, I'm guessing. Yeah. Go healthy with the vinegar. Oh yeah. Okay, the characteristic of a good Xiaolong Bao is how much soup is gonna be in there. There's a couple ways to eat this, but well, my spoon's small. I think I'm gonna go for a little dunk in the sauce first. I don't know if it's gonna be too hot, but to be honest, I like to one bite them. Some people like to empty the soup out of it. I'm gonna try a one bite, but I might regret it because it's probably gonna be super hot. But let's try, grab a little bit of ginger. Just explodes with soup. I love it with the ginger and a little bit of a sourness, acidity from the vinegar. It's got a lot of soup in there, which I love. Oh man, this is why you come to Taiwan. Soup complex. Look at these little beauties right here. Perfect little one biters. As I said, some people like to kind of pop it and then drink the soup out of it. But if it's not too hot, I like to just eat it like a one bite like this with lots of ginger. <laughs> Now, to be honest, this is pretty simple Taiwanese food, but as I haven't been here for a few years, this is like blowing my mind. I'm so happy to be back. I have some friends following me around today from uh, PTS, the public television service Taiwan there, uh, doing a little bit on uh, people coming to Taiwan during the pandemic, during the quarantine, and Taiwan's gonna be opening up soon. I'll talk a little bit more about it later, but I'm gonna enjoy my breakfast now. I'm here at a place called Matai An. This is an ecological wetland reserve and a place where you can come to experience the culture of the Amis. So what I'm going to be doing this morning is learning about the traditional fishing technique of the Amis. When the Amis first came to this area, they found that the rivers were abundant with fish and shrimp. And what they over time developed is this here, which is called palaka. It's basically a three layer trap. The bottom is bamboo, so bamboo hollowed out. The middle is sticks, and then the top is leaves. And then the shrimp and the different fish start to kind of hide within the palaka, the trap. And then they can just simply pull it out and they catch the fish. So it's quite an effective method. And here at Matayan, you can actually try it out for yourself. So we're gonna get into the water and see. Okay, so we're in the water. The palaka is set up in here, so we're gonna remove the, the leaves here first. Are these palm leaves? Yeah, palm tree. Okay. And underneath us, we, we should have some fish. The teacher just gave me a net, so we're gonna start to remove them and uh, hopefully we're gonna catch something. Bunch of uh, branches, kind of yeah. bang it. Oh yeah. Yeah, you can see there's quite a few little shrimp in there. So that's how you do it. Now let's try the bamboo. He's plugged both sides with his hands in case yes. there's something inside. And he, oh yeah, emptied it into the net. Looks like there's it's just some tiny, tiny little fish in there. You let the fish settle within the bamboo. They get comfortable in there, plug it, and then you use this net and kind of empty them out. Oh, sounds like there's a, oh, a big fish in here on the other side. Oh, look at this. Oh, wow. So there's the big tilapia in there. That is super cool. So they just get really comfy inside the bamboo and you can drop them into the net. Wow. Yep, nothing big in there. So that's the key. And basically they would lay these out in the river, tons of them, as many as they want and then just come back in the morning or the next day and empty them all out and hope for the best. 
Another important fact is that the water is flowing. So it needs to be set inside of a river that is flowing. Otherwise the little shrimp and the fish, they won't settle. They'll keep moving until they find flowing water and it keeps it nice and clean. We're going to be preparing an Ami's hot pot, but it's not your typical hot pot. They're doing it in a really unique way here. So they're actually gonna heat these rocks up to an extremely high temperature right in the fire and then use that to cook the hot pot. So the hot pot is right here. This one is fish with some ginger and you can see it's served in this bamboo. But sometimes they'll also use the beetle leaf, which is this right here. So they're gonna take the rocks, heat them up in the fire to extremely high temperature, put them into the hot pot and let that actually cook the fish like that. And then another one of the ingredients that Amis are famous for is their wild veggies. This is watercress right from that river that we just used the palaka in. You can see that this is just so, so hot. Give it a little bit of a rinse before we put it in the hot pot and then just watch it. It instantly boils the hot pot, rocks directly in there and that's gonna cook the fish. Wow, that is a seriously hot rock. Sitting down to eat now, and besides the hot pot, we have a spread of other foods here. Purple rice, some veggies here. This is wild boar, some fried shrimp, and then grilled tilapia salted on the outside. But I am here to try this, the hot pot, and served in the bamboo, such a unique dish. Big chunks of tilapia in there. Oh, the fish is really soft try some of the famous wild veggies the Amis are known for. Mm -hmm. Delicious. I've just made a discovery in the hot pot. They've actually left one of the rocks inside of there. And it's absolutely delicious too. What a delicious meal. And as you can see, Amis culture and nature are very intertwined. It's a very important part of their culture to respect nature. Now I'm going to be heading south to take you to another part of the island and show you more about the Amis cultures and traditions. Agriculture is an extremely important part of Amis culture. Traditionally, the focus crop was millet, but in recent times, it's become more popular to grow rice. So along the East Rift Valley here in Taiwan, you'll find tons of rice paddy fields like this one here. Right now, the rice is just about going to get golden yellow and then it will be ready for harvest. There's even an Amis harvest festival dedicated to the rice harvest. Of course, it's a staple food for the Amis, but you can also make another interesting product with rice, which I'm gonna go show you right now, and that is rice wine. So I'm here at Ba Yang restaurant with Ba Yang herself and she is an Amis. She's going to teach me the traditional way of making rice wine uh, recipe handed down for generations. So we've got just some pounded rice. So this is a special water that's got nine different herbs, wild herbs that uh, she's mixing in with the crushed rice. So we're just trying to get the consistency exactly right so we can make it into one of these little balls right here. Yeah. Trying to get it like, yeah, like the size of a ping pong ball. Okay. Yeah? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. 
So these little balls are sat for three days and then it will be mixed with uh, sticky rice and then you can actually start to uh, make the rice wine. This is what you're going to have uh, after three days of it sitting and uh, fermenting. So it's actually started to kind of develop a little bit of a fungus. So now we're gonna break it down <laughs> yeah. again, back into its original form. So this is the Amis traditional way of making the yeast. Okay, we gotta check the temperature to make sure that it's exactly right. It needs to be between 35 and 45 degrees, otherwise yes. it could destroy the yeast. So yes. I think it's a little bit too hot. There we go. Okay, temperature is correct. In goes the yeast. So is that finished? That's the whole process? After this, we just, yeah. just wait? Oh, thanks. Yes. Uh, okay. Besides those herbs that we used, it's just rice and water to make the uh, rice wine. And the concentration of alcohol after fermenting will be about between seven to nine percent. So it's almost like a strong beer. Gambe. Gambe. Oh, it's delicious. That's just the rice and those herbs that she added. It's uh, very, very good. Better than I was expecting. Gambe. <laughs> So this is actually Bayang's mother and father. We just watched their performance. It's absolutely beautiful. And they usually have the young children, but today is a school day. So now I think we're gonna hear uh, some uh, singing now. Uh, wine and that is how you do a traditional toast. I am so embarrassed that the average age of this group is 75 and they dance way better than I do. I'm only 28 years old. Maybe I need a little bit more of this before I can dance better. They end the show. Okay. Wow, that was fun. Oh, wow. All 
All right, what a way to end the day of experiencing the Amis culture. In order to get to Rao the Night Market, you're going to want to go to Songshan Station, take exit 5, and immediately upon exiting, you'll notice the big temple. So these night markets always are beside a temple. So immediately beside it, you'll see the big gate for Rao the Street Night Market. Then you're going to want to go in here, and the first thing you'll notice is a long line for the famous Fujo black pepper buns. That's what we're going to try first. Ouch. These black pepper buns are definitely one of the highlights of the Rauha night market. The way they make them is very simple. He starts with just a little bit of dough that he thins out and then fills it with a spiced pork mixture. And then he slaps in a ton of green onions, kind of a 50-50 ratio between pork and green onions, seals it up, puts a little bit of sesame seeds on top. Then they slap those in the tandoor oven, stick them to the side, cook them until they're golden crispy and then he uses a big ladle and a scraper to pull them out and they're selling these like hotcakes literally they are burning hot this is the final product here you can see I've got a little bit of a burnt edge here and then on this side it feels a lot more doughy and you got to be really careful with these things guys because they are hot inside with all that pork which kind of turns to a soup with all the fat but let me try it out I think it'll be okay Mm. Mm. Yum, yeah. It's got a very distinct flavor, strong black pepper. You can taste those green onions, of course. And then the texture of the dough is interesting because you get some bits that are flaky and really crunchy, and then you get some that are still doughy and a little bit less cooked. It's really juicy on the inside, but I just love the almost spiciness of that black pepper. Mm. Look at that filling. Yum. You get this kind of pork patty on the inside and it's almost like a hamburger, but the difference is it's enclosed. So you don't lose any of those juices. The end result is this peppery, juicy, delicious little bun. There's a bunch of places serving the pork rib medicinal broth soup. These guys got two big buckets of it out front and we ordered up the bowl and it doesn't look like much, but believe me, it smells incredible. It looks like just a bunch of bones because that's really all it is. It's meant to just kind of pick around the bone, get the little bits of meat off if there is any. And what you gotta have it with is the fermented bean paste. So there's a fermented bean paste with chili on the table. That's really where all the flavor is gonna come from. And of course from the broth, which is with tons of Chinese herbs and spices. I gotta try this first. It's got a light color though. It's pretty clear actually. Oh man, that's so good. That is more than meets the eye. That is so flavorful. You can taste the anise and you can taste those goji berries in there and it's very porky. But I gotta go in, go for one of these bones. They're really not much to eat off them, so I'll just try some of the meat first by itself. <laughs> yeah, there's like a millimeter worth of meat on the outside. So it's definitely a arduous task to eat all the meat off these, but oh man, that is tender and good. I gotta get some of that off. Let me try to rip this piece off. There we go. And I gotta dip this in the bean paste with chili and that'll just give it so much flavor. Oh man. Yeah, it's got a funk to it because it's fermented. And a little bit of spice, a little bit of sourness. Yeah, I'm gonna be here for a while picking all this meat off the bone. 
Mm. Alright, it's good though. It's all kind of luck of the draw here if you're gonna get a piece with a lot of meat on it and I would consider this a lot of meat because there really isn't barely any on these. And love it with that bean sauce. It's just got such a nice fermented funk to it and such a cool atmosphere just sitting right in the market, people walking behind me. Mm. Oh, that is so tender. Yum. It's dessert time and this may be my favorite thing in the route of the night market. These are two of my favorite Taiwanese desserts mixed together. Shaved ice and tangyuan. Tangyuan are these little mochi balls that have been stuffed, in this case with peanuts and with sesame. We have it here. And what this place does to really make it delicious is you can see these little flowers here. This is osmanthus. So it gives it this really amazing flavor. And they tell you, you gotta eat the tangyuan fast because the texture kind of gets too hard after a while. I can tell this one's gonna be the sesame because I can see the black. And then you can tell these ones over here are the uh, peanut. So let me try one of these. I'll just bite it open so I can show you the sesame inside. Oh yeah. Look at all that sesame. Yum. The sesame is mixed with a little bit of sugar, so it's sweet. Those tongyuan are served hot. That's why you don't want to wait too long, because otherwise they'll cool down. And I can already taste that osmanthus. Super fruity. Let's do one of the peanut ones next. Oh man, they're just so sticky. Just coat your mouth. Wow. It's basically peanut butter on the inside, and then that mochi on the outside, that pounded rice, is just so sticky. And you can taste it with a little bit of the ice. That osmanthus is just mind blowing. It's got such a strong fruit, floral, almost fruity flavor. It's really unique. So they've also got an additional bottle of the Osmanthus syrup and you can really load this up. I love that stuff. Oh man, that looks awesome. Let's give that a try now. Oh yeah. Oh, that is sweet. It just tastes like a flower, really. Like the smell of a flower. Yeah. My favorite part is when the shaved ice starts to melt a little bit. It gets a little bit watery. This is such a good alternative to ice cream. It's not unhealthy at all. And it's still got a nice sweetness and it feels like a satisfying dessert. It's just really refreshing, too. Brain oh. freeze a little bit. made up of many different islands and we are starting our day here in Magong City, the main city of Penghu, and we've come to Zhongyang Old Street. This is a really picturesque street showcasing the classic architecture of Penghu, mostly wood and brick buildings and kind of cobblestone roads. The streets are lined with the red lanterns and it's definitely a touristy place, but still very picturesque. So this is one of the main attractions on Zhongyang Old Street. It's called the Four-Eyed Well. It's this really peculiar well with these four different holes. And this was made during the Ming Dynasty. It's the oldest well in Magong City. And it's just really cool. I've never seen one quite like it before. Nowadays, I'm not sure it's being used as an actual water source, but you can definitely see lots of tourists using a bucket to grab it, the old style. Pretty cool. This 
street we are on this morning is just full of breakfast restaurants and you can easily spot which ones are popular because they've got lineups out the door. We came to this one that is serving Xiaobing, which is a type of Taiwanese bread that he cooks in similar to a tandoor oven. So he starts by spraying the dough with a little bit of water. The dough is topped with sesame seeds and then he completely sticks his full arm inside of the oven to stick the uh, Xiaobing to the side of the tandoor covers the entire surface of the oven and then puts the top on, lets it cook away. This place serves it with lots of different fillings. You can even get peanut butter here, but we went with the bacon and egg. I'm super excited to try this out. We have our breakfast. This is the Xiaobing with bacon and egg. As I mentioned, they actually put a little bit of a salad, some, uh, looks like Taiwanese five spice as well. Cucumbers, julienne, a little bit of cabbage, and then some green onions, but it's all about the bread. That's why we're really here. Let's try it out. Bread is doughy still, but it's kind of crispy on the outside where it was touching the side of the oven has become nice and crispy, but I love the kind of chewy doughy texture to it. Just a slight flavor of sesame, and then it's just packed full of those fillings, a lot of egg going on in there, and then a nice salty bacon. That is the perfect breakfast sandwich. As we were filming, the chef wanted us to try this one, which is the peanut butter with Yotiao, which is this fried cruller. He said that this one is his favorite and it smells so good and fragrant of peanut butter. Uh, I'm not sure what this is gonna taste like. It just looks like a lot of bread, but let's try it out. Mm. Mm. It's definitely more than meets the eye. At first glance, it's kind of just a bread sandwich. You've got the Yotiao on the inside and the Xiaobing on the outside but that peanut butter has saturated the yotiao on the inside, and then you get those different textures, that doughy uh, xiaobing on the outside, and then that crispy, crunchy yotiao on the inside with the flavor of the peanut butter. That's also really good. Our next stop on this breakfast street is just across from the xiaobing stall, a place serving yotiao. So the same thing we had inside that xiaobing with the peanut butter, but they are making it in this really old school shop, the traditional way. So the way that she does it, she starts by thinning out this dough, covered in a little bit of flour, then she'll chop it up into little strips, and then she'll double up the strips, so she'll kind of layer them, and then use a chopstick to press them together. Then she'll pull it out thin, drop it in the hot oil and fry it up. They're frying it up in this kind of makeshift frying pan and you've got the golden crispy yo tiao at the end, which really by itself isn't much. So that's why we also got uh, some doujiang, the soy milk cold version. Let me try out this and then chase it with some soy milk. Not much to it. <laughs> oh, that is refreshing. It's not about the flavor, it's really about the texture here. You've got a little bit of saltiness, but other than that, there's not much to it. It's just nice and crispy, and then it's got this kind of chewiness on the inside. Yotiao directly translates to oil stick, and it's no joke, this thing is seriously oily, and they're just frying it in a massive vat of oil and making tons of them. Really goes nicely with the soy milk. Nice and refreshing soy flavor. Mm. This is a really traditional Taiwanese breakfast. Not necessarily Peng Hu style, but very authentic nonetheless. So our first stop today is for a classic bowl of Taiwanese beef noodles, but this is a halal version. So there's actually two restaurants that are both serving halal Taiwanese beef noodles. The first one is called Chang's Beef Noodle Soup, and then the other one is called Lao Zhang. We're gonna go to this one, Lao Zhang. So let's go inside.
We are sitting down in the restaurant. It looks no different than a typical local Taiwanese beef noodle joint, but this one is certified halal. So we have the menu here, and one thing that's really nice about this place is it has Chinese, English, Japanese, and Bahasa. So we went with the braised beef soup noodles, but then another really cool thing about this place is that you can choose between a couple different things. You can have noodles, you can have vermicelli, or you can have bread, and then they have another type of noodles. We went with the bread and then one more thing that we wanted to try is the beef dumpling so really excited to try that um, obviously here in Taiwan usually the dumplings are filled with pork I don't know if I've ever seen beef noodle or beef dumplings at another restaurant so really excited to try those out So here I have my beef noodle soup, but substituted with bread. You can see those big chunks of bread. Those look really hearty. And then there is some nice beef hiding in there as well. Look at that, that is a huge chunk of beef. So he puts a little bit of red oil in here, mixes it with two kinds of broths, and then tops it with a little bit of green onions. And I just gotta try the soup as it is first. Mm. Oh yum, that is so beefy. And then a little bit of freshness from those green onions and then a little bit salty and a little bit spicy from that red oil, that chili oil that he puts in it as well. Next up, I'm gonna try one of these fat chunks of bread. Mm. That is some seriously dense bread. The soup actually doesn't penetrate the whole way through. Only a couple of millimeters in, so it's not soggy whatsoever. It's really uh, not hard, like crunchy, but very dense and kind of a little bit difficult to chew. Okay, let me find a piece of beef here. Oh man, that is just a huge chunk of beef. Let's give that a try. Mm. Yum. Super tender, a little bit of fat on the outside, and that's been braising away in Taiwanese spices. They definitely have their own spice blend here because there's some unique flavors to it. So there's a couple condiments on the table to dress your bowl of noodles up. First is a little bit extra of that chili oil, that red oil, and I'll put a little bit of that. I'm not sure how spicy it's gonna be. And then this is a classic beef noodle topping. That's the pickled mustard greens. Gives it a little bit of sourness and adds a little bit of fresh crunch. Mix those around and really love this bread. It's so unique. Mm. Mm -mm. Next up, we've got the beef dumplings. I've got some vinegar here and I like a lot of vinegar on my dumplings and then a little bit of soy sauce as well. And these just look really, really good. Just boiled dumplings, but filled with only beef. Mm. Those are awesome, I love them. The wrapper is nice and chewy, really beefy once again. And then with that sourness, that acidity coming from the vinegar, a little bit of saltiness coming from the soy sauce. Really love it, I mean, I'd, I'd probably go for beef if it was more widely available than the pork. All of this food is really authentic. There's no differences in the flavors whatsoever, but all certified halal. And this dish really unique with the bread, except you can, of course, get the regular beef noodle soup as well, which I'm sure is just as delicious. That was really delicious. They have a lot of other items on their menu that also looked good. And usually here in Taiwan, beef tends to be more expensive, but that was priced equally to any other um, beef noodle restaurant here in Taipei. So we didn't eat a whole lot purposefully because we want to take you to another restaurant that's pretty close by. So just off of one of the main streets near Taipei Main Station, you turn down this little alleyway and this is known as Little Indonesia. So there's a ton of Indonesian restaurants and we have one picked out that we wanted to try. But we just got here and now it seems as though that all the restaurants are closed. So it is Monday, I'm guessing that's why they're closed. Even though on Google Maps it says that they're supposed to be open, uh, I think we might have to wait and come back tomorrow to show you the Indonesian food that we wanted to try here. Um, we'll try to ask around, see if they can tell us the hours, and we'll catch back up with you maybe tomorrow. <laughs> so we actually just uh, spotted someone walking down the street and I think they are closed. 
but they kind of opened up for us just to come in. Really friendly little guy here. Hi. So they have a buffet here of all these different Indonesian foods. Oh, it smells so good. I can smell the coconut, but they also have some things a la carte so you can order. We ordered a couple different things, but this is really cool. All halal looks really good. So I've got my food here. This is the soto ayam, which is an Indonesian aromatic soup. You can see there's little vermicelli noodles, looks like some tomatoes, tons of bean sprouts, some green onions, and fried shallots, and there may or may not be chicken inside. This may not have the chicken as I thought I ordered, but it's okay. Let me just try some of this broth first. Yum. Wow. Generally, Taiwanese flavors are a little bit subtle, but Indonesian is almost the polar opposite, is bursting with flavor, so very salty. I can taste some ginger in there. There's definitely a lot of spices going on there. Okay, let me go in with uh, some of the noodles, and what's kind of funny about this is they actually serve it with rice, too. You can put your noodles on your rice if you'd like. It's really heavy on the carbs, but tastes good. Let's try that. Mm. 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 So the chicken was hiding down at the bottom of the bowl. I found some pieces of the chicken. Let me transfer this onto my rice again. And then I gotta get some of that soup. It's so flavorful. I don't know what they're doing to it, but it just tastes so good. Mm. That is good. So our last stop is for another classic Taiwanese street food. This time it is fried chicken. And we did a lot of research to find a place that is serving uh, halal certified fried chicken. So this place called Fried Chicken Master uh, here in Gongguan, Taipei is serving uh, halal fried chicken. So we've got it here and Taiwan's uh, fried chicken is famous for being these huge big pieces called da ti pai, which means big chicken steak and it's covered in a little bit of uh, Taiwanese five spice, probably some white pepper and stuff too, and that just looks crazy crunchy, so let me take a big bite here. Wow. I don't even know how they keep it so juicy on the inside. That chicken breast is so tender, so succulent, and then super crunchy on the outside. A lot of white pepper there, so it's got a little bit of uh, spicy heat and definitely that Taiwanese zing to it with that five spice. That's really yummy. So of course there are tons of fried chicken joints here in Taipei. Really there is one on every corner it seems. Uh, this one, as I mentioned though, Halal certified Muslim friendly restaurant and it's really good chicken too. It's not just the only place that was Halal. This place is also serving some really delicious chicken. So crispy and so juicy at the same time. So I'm a huge fan of the atmosphere at this spot. It is set down this little back alley, very quiet in front of the temple underneath the banyan tree. You get lots of shade, you can hear the birds, and even though it's quite hidden, there are a lot of locals eating here, and it's a great place for our breakfast. So we have our breakfast here. The first one is the kanji, the rice porridge. You can see all of those uh, little pieces of rice in there, and there's also some meat inside, and it looks like some onions, some maybe fried shallots, and there should be some celery in there as well. And then this is a really interesting dish. This is the red yeast deep fried pork. You can see the layer of fat and meat there, and then the crunchy exterior, a little bit of daikon radish, and then it's served with a red sauce. I'm just gonna start with some of this congee. This is such a perfect little breakfast item. Very simple. And there's really not much to it. That rice is so soft, it completely falls apart in your mouth. You definitely need to add some of the white pepper. Add some of this white pepper and give it a little mix. And let me try one of these pieces of meat. Mm. That was very traditional, but very hearty and delicious breakfast. Mm. 
Okay, let's try out the red yeast fried pork. There are little pieces of bone, and I'm gonna take a piece of radish here, piece of pork, dip it in that sauce, give that a try. Mm. A little bit oily, a little bit fatty, but very tender, and definitely not as healthy an option as the kanji, but I really love that crispy exterior, and then with that kind of sweet and sour sauce, really good. So these dishes are just two of the many options at all of these street food stalls. We've even had smoked shark here before. There's all kinds of different things, but I really love the kanji for breakfast. And then it contrasts perfectly with the kind of greasy, uh, fatty, deep fried pork. That is an awesome breakfast option. Really great way to start the day. And I'm just in love with this place. It's been a long time since we've been here last, but the atmosphere is very unique. There's uh, not any other place that I've been to in Taiwan with a courtyard in front of the temple filled with tables for all the street food stalls to uh, serve. And it's definitely not touristy. It is really local. We're gonna head for another breakfast spot today. sat down at our next spot and this one is just as traditional as the last. I love the atmosphere right on the side of the road and I actually I'm just sitting at this little wooden kind of school desk and I've got their classic dishes here. So the first one is their rib soup. So these are huge pork ribs, just absolutely massive. Look at that. And then we've also got a big daikon hiding underneath there. And then over here is their vegetable rice. I can see some carrots. I can see some shallots and cabbage. And I'm just gonna start by trying a little bit of this thin broth here. Oh, that is good. Very simple. It just tastes like the daikon and maybe some other vegetables, but they are not cooking the uh, ribs in that broth, that stock. That is just a vegetable-based stock. And then the ribs are cooked in another and then mixed together, but that is really tasty. Let's try some of the meat now. Just look at the amount of meat on the side of this thing. Oh, it fell right off the bone. I'm just gonna dip it in the soup a little bit and try that. Wow, that is tender. Wow, that is just melt in your mouth, fall apart and really natural tasting. And then it's kind of infused with that uh, daikon broth. That is so good and so much meat. Mm. Wow. Next up, let's try the daikon. Wow. So juicy. Really fresh vegetable flavor, full of all that liquid soup. And then it's got a, still a bit of a crisp uh, texture to it. It's not too soft. So this dish may look simple, but this is their uh, second most famous thing, their vegetable rice. And it looks like there's probably quite a bit of oil too. Let's give this a try. Mm. Mm. That is a burst of flavor. It's honestly more flavorful than the rib soup. It's just packed full of, you can taste onions, the shallots in there. And then it's got a little bit of an oiliness, so it's got a unique a sticky texture to it. That is uh, more than meets the eye, really flavorful. These ribs have the bone on, of course, but they are not shy with the meat here. There is so much meat, look at that. That is like a massive, almost like a tomahawk steak. Yum, so tender, wow. Whew, another great stop, really traditional spot and some delicious ribs. They do have sauce for those ribs, which we didn't try this time, but we've eaten there before and their sauce is really good, spicy and a little bit sour. And we're just gonna head to the famous Gihua Street, which is kind of like the epicenter of Datong District.
you will know when you're getting close to Dihua Street because you will start to smell it. There's a special aroma about this place. And it's kind of like a Taiwanese spice market, but a lot of the ingredients aren't necessarily spices, just different dried items. And a lot of these will be used in different uh, broths. So you can actually buy little packets that are meant for making soup broths and that's how you get those really deep Taiwanese flavors. All kinds of interesting ingredients, lots of Chinese medicines, lots of like barks and dried shiitake mushrooms, dried seafood, dried fruits, uh, all kinds of different things. There's definitely some things that are not necessarily good like uh, shark fin and maybe bird's nest but uh, there are also a lot of interesting ingredients. It's a really cool place to just walk around. The buildings are an incredible old architecture, and this is an old economic hub of Taipei that has been around for centuries. So we popped into this really cool shop that is serving all kinds of different tea, and we ordered their bitter tea. So it's a black tea that is infused with all kinds of different herbs to give it this really bitter flavor, and it helps to rid the body of toxins. I'm not exactly sure what uh, ingredients they put in it because there's so many mysterious ingredients in Dihua Street, so it's just a concoction. But let me try it out here. Oh, wow. Okay. I've had the bitter tea before, but that stuff is like extremely bitter. Wow. I can't say it's really refreshing because it kind of hurts to go down. It's almost painful, it's so bitter. Wow. But that'll definitely wake you up. Oh my God, I don't even know what to compare it to. It's like almost drinking something you're not supposed to drink, like a chemical or something, but it's all natural. So since the soup we wanted to try was not available, it's not in season right now, we were a little bit disappointed and we spotted this other restaurant. It's more of a modern style restaurant, but they have some unique medicinal broth soup. So we ordered their ginseng chicken soup and it was not our plan to come here, but we're gonna try it out. Not sure if it's gonna be good or bad, but let's try it out. Our soup has arrived and it smells so fragrant. It's got this golden color to it. And there are some jujubes floating around in there, some goji berries, and then that ginseng, which is really where all that flavor is gonna come from. Popular in Korean cooking. Um, maybe not so common in Taiwan, but I love it. And I'm just gonna take some of the broth and put it into my bowl here and try it like that first. Mm, I love it. It's not salty. It's not too salty at all. And it's got a little bit of a sweetness, sort of a ginger flavor. And then that ginseng tastes earthy and just healthy, rich. It's got a really deep flavor to it. Wow, there's a lot going on in there. Mm, I wasn't sure if this place was going to be good or not, but the soup is really good. I gotta try some of the chicken. So let me fish out some of the chicken and look at that. It looks so tender. Yeah, that's just completely fall off the bone. Let's try that. Oh man, wow. You can taste natural chicken flavor. It is completely infused though at the same time with all of that ginseng broth. So succulent, so moist. Wow, that is a really good soup. I love that. I'm glad that we just found this new spot. It's called Regime Cuisine. Regimen Cuisine and really good ginseng soup. They have a couple other different things. Very like revitalizing. I just feel full of energy now. And one of the best things about this Datong district is that there are just so many snacks to try and they're all within a close proximity to each other. So we're just walking across the street to our next spot. dessert we are at this place that serves all kinds of different things but what they're really famous for is their almond tea so we have the almond tea right here it is served hot it's got this beautiful milky white uh, color and just in a mug and that is piping hot and I've also got the yotiao which is translates to oil stick it's kind of like a fried cruller but uh, first I just gotta try the almond tea as is
That is so good. It doesn't look like it's gonna taste so strong, but it's got this fruity kind of nutty aroma to it and it's very thick and creamy. A unique texture, it kind of lines the whole of your mouth with this film, it is so good. I don't even know how they make it taste like that. So I'm just gonna dip my Yotia directly in the almond tea and this thing is absolutely huge. Look at the size of this, whoa. Mm. Maybe not as crispy as they get. It might be a little bit stale. Very oily and it's got a little bit of a savoriness to it and it contrasts and complements the almond tea really nicely. Mm. Such a unique combination. So we're at our next stop and this place is, as I mentioned, serving something very unique. So they're actually grilling uh, manto, which is a steamed bread on charcoal. So they're grilling the manto and then we've ordered one that comes with cream and condensed milk. So first she slathers on some cream and then she uses the condensed milk to uh, just completely smother it. So this is the sweet version. They also have toast that they're grilling in the same way on charcoal and you can get savory versions as well. We have it here and you can see that uh, burnt outer layer and this is just a steamed bread so it's very fluffy and soft and then a little crispy on the bottom. Then on the inside, all that condensed milk and cream has melted away into the manto. Mm. Oh, that's good. It is actually quite sweet. Both the cream and the condensed milk are full of sugar and they've melted away into the bun. It's kind of saturated the bun and it maintains its steamed texture. So it's got that really fluffy kind of bouncy texture to it. But then on the outside, there's kind of a crisp layer and very smoky from that charcoal. It's not much, but it's very unique and I've never seen it done this way anywhere else in Taiwan. Yeah, pretty good. Bye bye. That was really cool. Really unique food and you're probably wondering why we're only eating little tiny things and that is because even though this Dangang town is very small and sleepy, there is a lot of food to try, a lot of unique foods. Tucked down one of the small alleys off the main strip of the market is this stall that's selling traditional authentic Taiwanese meatballs. So they've got this big um, frying pan filled with all the meatballs and they're kind of braising away. And also he's got different sausages, rice sausage and uh, pork sausage. So we've ordered up uh, two of their things. The first is of course the meatball. So you can see that they have this very glutinous wrapper that's made with rice flour. And then he's topped it in some garlic water with some sweet brown sauce and a little bit of cilantro. Over here we've got the sausage. This is the pork sausage. And then once again, topped with garlic and that brown sauce, which is just really unique. So these meatballs are actually stuffed with pork and shrimps. Let's try one out. Mm. Mm. Oh my God, instantly the garlic just burns your mouth. There's so much garlic, it's almost like chili. It's so spicy and strong. And then that glutinous wrapper on the outside has the same texture as that brown sugar cake we had this morning. And then filled with chunks of pork. That's pretty good. Mm. Let's try one of these sausages. Mm. Once again, just really covered in that garlic. It is like scorching hot garlic that burns your mouth. And the sausage has a unique texture with a kind of uh, bouncy chewiness on the outside. It's pretty good sausage. So Taiwanese meatballs are available all across the island. Usually they're a little bit bigger than that and those ones had a unique flavor. I would say for my liking a little heavy on the garlic that is gonna wreck me for the rest of the day with the garlic and my taste in my mouth. Yeah. 
So we were just walking down the street, spotted these friendly ladies, and they're actually sun-drying mullet roe, which is a popular, very, very popular uh, cuisine or, I guess, ingredient here in Taiwan. Usually you just eat it on its own or maybe with a cucumber or something, and it's a, quite an intricate process because they first need to wash it very thoroughly, and then they need to cure it, I think, with salt, and then they'll sun-dry it for, I don't know, a couple days or something. But she's got all these ones laying out here, mullet roe. So we just popped into this really small place it's not busy right now we're the only people here and we wanted to try their very unique dish called roll gul and this is something that's con consisting of a lot of different ingredients so first off is the sausages here then we have some uh, shredded pork bits and then we have these big chunks of rice cake underneath and then one of the really interesting ingredients here is these little prawns. They're called sakura prawns, and they're very important to Donggong because they're only found here and in one other place in Japan. So very uh, limited in the world. And then it's all swimming in this soup, this very thick, thick soup. And I'm gonna give it a little bit of a mix here because you can see she put some sauce at the bottom, that brown sauce, and we wanna mix that all in get all those ingredients mixed in and I've never seen anything like this and that's why we wanted to come to Dongong to try all of these interesting dishes. So let me try a bit of the soup with some of this rice cake. Mm. Mm. The consistency is similar to kanji and it's got a light seafood flavor which I really like. That rice cake was just completely like fall apart. It wasn't chewy like the rice cake we had this morning, but more just like uh, fall apart in your mouth, crumble almost. Let's get a little bit of uh, some of the other ingredients here. I wanna try one of the sakura shrimp and then maybe uh, the sausage. And it's all just swimming in the soup, which is so unique. Mm. Crunchy little shrimp, a sweet sausage. Wow, that's a unique dish, I like it. The variety of ingredients in here really complement each other. There's so many different things going on in here, but they really work well. I have to give it up though for the sakura prawn and then that fall apart rice cake. The sakura prawn has such a vibrant color to it, which I'm guessing the name comes from. And also that rice cake just goes well with it because it's a little crunchy from the prawn and then very soft from that rice cake. Mm. Oh, so we've come down to the Donglong Temple, which is definitely the most important temple here in Dangang. And it was built in 1706, but it was destroyed by a typhoon and then they rebuilt it in 1894. And it has, in my opinion, one of the most magnificent gates in any temple in Taiwan. And actually this is the site of a very interesting festival that takes place where they burn a boat. And fortunately, my buddy Wes Davies is actually kind enough to give us some footage from that festival. So unfortunately we weren't around for the festival, but make sure to go check out Wes's channel, give him a subscribe and you can watch his videos on Taiwan, really great content. I would love to visit that festival someday. It just looks like a lot of excitement. So let's go inside the Donglong Temple and take a look inside. Definitely a beautiful temple, a lot of activity going on. The stonework at this one in particular is really incredible. It depicts all of these images and it's just, you could spend all day here just looking at all the different intricate details. And we are going to keep heading though because we're gonna go back to Kaohsiung. It is getting so hot and we're gonna ride the scooter back. It's about an hour, so that's gonna be a hot ride but we want to take you to see one more street food in Kaohsiung that I'm really, really excited to try. Okay. 
So we are back in Kaohsiung City now. That was about an hour drive. We are just off one of these main busy roads and uh, after a quick change, we have come to have some roast duck. Love is love. Love is love. So you can see they've got all the ducks hanging here. So they'll hang them to dry for a little while before actually roasting them in these huge cauldrons. And uh, that helps to get that skin extra crispy because it's dried before they roast it. Uh, we've ordered up half a duck and uh, this is a takeout shop only. So we're gonna jump back on the scooter before taking it to the hotel to eat. <laughs> These are the big pots that they are roasting the ducks in and the owner is really really friendly. They're actually using charcoal to roast these ducks. You can see all the excess oil dripping away. <laughs> really really friendly guys. Okay we got our duck. That was 250 so pretty cheap. It's a half a duck and they gave us the wraps and everything. And as I mentioned we gotta go home to eat this because this is takeout only but really cool place. Back in the hotel room now. That was such a cool restaurant and we've got a couple different things. So first off the main course is the duck meat with the skin attached. So you can see that beautiful glistening oily skin and then there's a nice chunk of meat on the bottom. Most of this, if not all of it, it should be boneless. So she actually takes the duck and kind of skims the outside of it to just get a little layer of meat, a layer of fat, and then the layer of that crispy skin. The way it's served is kind of Beijing style with these little, almost like tortilla wrappers and then with a scallion, green onion, and then their special duck sauce. And wow, my mouth is watering like crazy because I love this stuff and I haven't had it in a long time. I'm gonna take a piece here, show you how to make it. So you can just put it inside, take a little bit of the sauce, put it on your wrapper. It's a nice brown, dark sauce. There we go. And then take one of these green onions. They didn't give us a whole lot of green onions, so I'm gonna rip it in half. Just put half, and then wrap this up all nice and pretty, and just try it like so. Mm. Mm. <laughs> mm -hmm. That sauce is nice and sweet. You can definitely feel the oiliness of that duck meat on the inside crisp crunch from the green onion. And then that wrapper, it's a, got a little bit of an elasticity to it. But unfortunately I couldn't really feel the texture of that skin. So let me just go in and pick a piece or just a piece of skin like that. And let's try that. Oh. It just dissolves. Such a strong duck flavor, but not gamey. Just really oily and natural flavor. So when you order half a duck, you also get this other dish, which is basically everything that's left over after they skim the outside of it. So there's a lot of bones, there's definitely some meat left over, and then they stir fry it with green onions, onions, and basil. You can see some of the pieces are just completely bone, but then if you do a little bit of searching, you can find some nice pieces of meat. Let me give this a try. Mm. They definitely started fried it with a little bit of chili too because it's got some spiciness to it. That is really juicy. It's even more flavorful than the wrap, to be honest. Even though this is just the leftovers, it's still really good. Mm. Definitely a little harder to eat though. So I'm really into the Japanese architecture and the wabi-sabi and this place just is a perfect example. It's got all the different parts of a classic traditional Japanese house. You've got this veranda area which kind of acts as a hallway between the rooms. You've got the paper walls literally made of paper with the sliding doors like this. And then if you go in here, You've got the tatami mats, and then they use these as kind of like a room divider, very um, just artistic and simple. 
open concept. I love it. So after checking out the museum for about a half an hour, it's not too big. We are sitting down in their restaurant, also traditional Japanese style, and they're serving the kaiseki directly inside the museum here. Their menu is beautiful, and luckily for us, they also have an English menu. Now you can get a vegetarian version, but I think we're gonna go for the non-veg version, just because that's what we prefer, but love the setting in here. It is beautiful. They've got everything down to a T. It's perfectly all Japanese and having some tea before our meal arrives. Add some tea down to the tea. So our first dish has arrived. It looks absolutely beautiful as I predicted. This is the sous vide pork chop it's served with a sweetened kumquat. A couple little pickles there, but I gotta try the pork chop first. Mm. Mm. <coughs> It's not necessarily tender, but it's very juicy and it's been seasoned nicely with a lot of black pepper. It's got a little kick from that pepper. I'm gonna try a piece with this sweetened kumquat. I'm gonna kind of squeeze some of this stuff from the inside of it because I don't want to eat the whole thing. And that is gonna give a nice sweetness. Mm. Oh yeah, that was a good pairing. A little bit of citrusiness, definitely sweet and a little bit sour too. It complements the pork nicely. Our next dish is a Gemini's chicken salad. This is salt roasted chicken. I can feel it's nice and crispy. It's got this sauce, the salad dressing on the side. Just pour that all over top here. And we've got some little pea sprouts back here. I'll grab some of those. This is such a beautiful little salad. Grab some of the chicken. Let's try that. Mm. Oh man, the chicken is so moist. That dressing looked like it was gonna be really powerful, but it's actually very light in flavor. Just this hint of black pepper once again, and then very moist chicken. You can feel that crispy skin too. One thing the Japanese are really good at besides making delicious food is also artfully presenting it. So every dish in your kaiseki is going to be just gorgeously presented. This is the steamed course. So we've got this steamed egg, but it's got seafood in there. So I'm gonna kind of dig down deep. There should be maybe some shrimp or crab somewhere hiding in there. I don't wanna wreck it too much. And there's some little edamame too. Oh, I see some fish. So let me try this first. Oh, that's awesome. It reminds me of a seafood chowder from Atlanta, Canada, but it's completely smothered in this creamy custardy egg. And it's just got a very light flavor, light seafood flavor. I gotta go back in because I know there's some more seafood hiding in here. I can see something here. Looks like maybe a shrimp, I believe. Let me try to get that. Oh look, there's a looks like a piece of chicken in there as well. I thought this was just seafood. There it is. Oh, ah. mm. Mm. Course number four. This is the kabayaki black eel. There's a pea in here, a little carrot, some tofu, and it's swimming in a, a bit of a stalk. So I'm gonna grab. I think there's an oyster mushroom underneath there too. So all kinds of things. I'm gonna grab this pea, the eel and try that. Mm. It definitely has a strong eel flavor, but it's not overpowering. There's a light soy, maybe a little bit of sake flavor in there as well. Um, not very flavorful though, very simple once again. And there's a couple other pieces of eel in here, but I gotta go for this oyster mushroom. I love these things. I love the bouncy texture. This is the first main course, the crispy skin grilled salmon. Look at that. It is so crispy on the outside. Listen to that crunch. Then we've also got a little Japanese pickle on the side here. I'm gonna kind of rip this in half and try a chunk of that. That looks so juicy. You can see all that oil coming out of it. Wow. Oh my god. That was like a shell of crispy skin encasing just oil almost. I don't even think I got any of the meat. I gotta go in for another bite because I think that was just fat that had disintegrated. Maybe I'm wrong, but look at it. It's just so ridiculously juicy. Let me try one more bite here. 
Nope. Wow. There must be such a high fat content. So this is our second main course. This is the sixth dish we have, and this is the rice dish. So we've got it topped with some ginkgo seeds, there's fresh edamame, and this is a pickled radish that's been pickled with perilla. So it's all on top of the steamed rice. And then it's served on this really cool, like little, uh, almost like a little table. You get a little bit of the edamame, the ginkgo seeds, and the rice. Mm. It's really simple. There's not too much to it. The ginkgo seeds kind of envelop the rice. It's a very glutinous, sticky rice, but there's really not a whole lot of flavor going on there. It's just kind of something to fill you up because a lot of these dishes, as you've seen, are very small. Let me try this perilla pickled radish. That sounds so cool. Mm. That's got flavor. Next up is the soup. This is the garlic, huge chunks of garlic you can see there, and clam soup with Japanese wild parsley. I think I'm just gonna take one of these clams and a whole piece of that garlic, and hopefully that doesn't overdo it. Grab some of that parsley too. Oh, yeah. oh my god, that is so good. I'm not even sure how the garlic is retaining its form because as soon as I pressed down my tongue on it, it disintegrated, it fell apart into a million little pieces. The clam has a nice firm texture still to it. I really love that. That might be my favorite dish so far. So that was a good little snack, but now we are moving on to the main course. The sun is down and we are at an izakai or a Japanese bar. This place is called Tesho Hiroshima Yaki. We're gonna tell you all about it inside. We're gonna get some really good drinks and food. Let's go. So we are inside now, and this place is pretty much as close as you can get to a legit Japanese izakaya. It's decked out in all the old school Japanese memorabilia. They have the kind of tapenyaki style set up right in front of you. We're sitting bar side. We've ordered up a couple of drinks, and I got the sake. So the way that they do it here is also Japanese style. They serve it to you in a little box, and he overflows it, so a little extra uh, for free. It is super cool to sit right in front of these guys working and watching them make the Hiroshima style okonomiyaki. The way that he makes it is really unique. He starts by thinning out a batter on the griddle until it fries into almost like a thin crepe. And then he tops it with a little bit of their sweet sauce, the okonomiyaki sauce. And then he tops that with just a ton of shredded cabbage. On top of the cabbage, he puts a couple extra little ingredients, some green onions, and then finishes it with some bean sprouts. So at the same time, he's also starting to fry the yakisoba, the, the fried noodles, and those will come in later. So after that, he puts a couple strips of bacon on top, and then on top of the bacon, he takes a little bit more of that batter to use it as an adhesive for the noodles. Then he flips the entire thing over on top of the yakisoba. Then he cracks an egg on the griddle, fries the egg, and then puts the full thing on top of the fried egg. Once it's finished, he tops it with just a ton of that okonomiyaki sauce, a little bit of uh, seasoning, and then a little bit of red pickled ginger. We have the final product here. It's served on this hot plate. It's beautiful. You can see all those seasonings on top, a little bit of sesame seeds, and it smells and looks amazing. Back here, we've got the meatballs, chicken meatballs. Meatballs, pretty simple, but you can see that beautiful yolk 
in the middle, that uncooked egg yolk. And the way that you're gonna do this uh, okonomiyaki is you gotta use this, which is the Japanese mayo. So this is always my favorite part. Take the cap off and they've got this special um, bottle that it comes in and it sprays it. Oh yeah, here we go. <laughs> and you can be generous, really. I like to be really generous. There's nothing healthy about this, so just load it up. And then they also give you these mini spatulas, which you can use to just chop this thing in half. Or in a, it's kind of like a pizza. I like to cut it like pizza. Cut it down the middle once, get through all those noodles at the bottom, and then cut yourself a slice of okonomiyaki. Oh man, this just looks so good. Transfer this over to my plate. It is smoking hot because it's served on that hot plate. Oh no. There's nothing pretty about that. That is covered with sauce. The okonomiyaki sauce, so tangy. And then you can taste or feel those noodles, I should say. They're kind of fried up and almost a little bit crispy at the bottom. It's just sloppy and delicious. Ugly delicious. <laughs> oh man. I love it with the bacon in there. This is the secret okonomiyaki sauce here. Well, it's not so secret. This is the brand and this beautiful lady here is where all that flavor is coming from. So you can actually add some extra even though they already go very generous with the okonomiyaki sauce, but that's really where all the beautiful flavor is coming from. So tangy and just perfectly complements sake or a beer. Our second dish, as I mentioned earlier, is the chicken meatballs topped with some of that brown sauce once again and the egg in the middle, just how they do it in Japan. Completely raw. They give you this little wooden spoon so you can mix it around. Oh man, that is just a thing of beauty. I love the egg yolk too. And you don't need to worry at all because these are super high quality eggs. Let me grab one of these meatballs. Oh man. This is gonna be great. The best part about those chicken meatballs is that they actually leave these little bits of cartilage inside of the meatball. They're evenly distributed, so you get these little kind of crunchy bits all throughout. Super creamy from that egg yolk, and then just a hint from that green onion. And it's not actually the okonomiyaki sauce, I think it's a different, like almost like a teriyaki sauce, more sweet than tangy. Really good meatball though. It is a very rainy day today and we've come to a local fresh market in search of a classic Cantonese breakfast street food and it should be just up here. Where are you from? Canada. Canada. Yeah. <laughs> There is a man inside this market that is serving a very typical Cantonese dish, chong fun. And the way that he makes it is very interesting. He uses this rice flour that he's mixed with quite a bit of water. He lays the rice flour out with a ladle on top of a steaming sheet. And then on top of that, he'll put uh, whatever ingredients you wanna order. We ordered a couple different kinds. So we got the pork, we got the egg, he put some lettuce on it and then shrimp and then he takes that sheet and stuffs it inside of the steamer, lets it steam away for maybe only a minute until it's done. And then once it's done, he pulls it out and scrapes it right off, and then they'll top it with a uh, thick soy sauce, and it makes a great breakfast, a very typical dish in Hong Kong. We've got it here, though, in Taipei. And we've got all the shrimp, there's all kinds of ingredients, and you can see that rice flour gets this really unique uh, texture to it, almost like uh, gelatinous and gooey. Let me try it, I can see a little bit of pork in there. Mm. Yum. It's got a really smooth texture. It doesn't take much to uh, chew it down. And then the flavor is mainly from that sauce. I gotta go in and get some uh, with the shrimp. And then we've got a little bit of chili over here too. So I'll put a little bit of chili. And then there's these little pickles as well. And I'll just get a big, oh yeah, I can see some egg and some of that lettuce. Mm. 
It's really hearty with all those ingredients, but it still feels light at the same time. We ordered the version that's 130 Taiwan dollars. Comes with, as I mentioned, the shrimp, the pork, the egg, and I love it with that chili sauce. I could just sit here all morning and eat this stuff. It's so good. And we've just got this one little table that we're sitting at. This is mostly a takeout stall, I think, right within the market. That was a great breakfast, but arguably in Hong Kong, brunch is more important than breakfast. Otherwise known as yum cha, it involves sitting for hours, drinking tea, and eating steamed dim sums. We've come to one of the most famous places to have dim sum in Taipei. It's the Brother Hotel, and we're gonna go up to their popular plum blossom room to have yum cha. This is a beautiful restaurant on the second floor of the Brother Hotel. They have an extensive dim sum restaurant and they're serving authentic Cantonese cuisine. We're gonna order up some of the classic dim sum dishes, but it wouldn't be yum cha without the tea. We've got tea guan yin, which is my favorite type of tea. And you just sit here for hours and eat with all your friends and family. It's a really relaxing atmosphere. <laughs> One of the really cool features of this restaurant is that they roll the dim sum baskets around on the cart. You can pick some of the dim sums off there, but of course some of them you just have to order a la carte. But that's really a traditional style and I love to see it here in Taiwan. Did you see it? Our order has arrived. We've got all our steam baskets full of dim sum and I've got a special one hiding underneath here for dessert, keeping it warm with this one stacked on top. But first I gotta start with this. This is one of the most famous. This is the Xiao Mai. So it's got an egg wrapper filled with pork and shrimp and then a little bit of crab roe on top. Mm. Mm. It's got a very thin wrapper on the outside and a nice firm kind of pork meatball minced up. That slight flavor of seafood from that crab roe. I'm gonna go for one of these guys next. This is the beef meatballs. There's all these little peas on the inside too. Very classic one. Mm. Oh, that was tender. That beef ball is definitely more tender than the Xiao Mai and just a slight sweetness to it. Nice with those peas as well. This one is the Har Gao. It is filled with shrimp and it's got this thin kind of translucent wrapper. That's the perfect little one biter, and it's actually got some sweet corn inside. All of these dim sums just go so nicely with tea too. You just gotta wash them all down with it. This is my all time favorite dim sum. It is the Cha Shao Bao. And you can see that on the inside, it is just filled with that beautiful braised pork. Uh, always make sure you rip the little piece of parchment paper off the bottom. And let's try this. That pork is very sweet on the inside and the bun on the outside is just so pillowy and soft. It's like eating a cloud. This one is the egg tart and you can see that flaky layered crust on the outside. Mm. Oh. That's a beautiful little pastry, so flaky, so crispy, and then a nice creamy custard on the inside. The atmosphere is crazy. There's people that have been here long before us and they're just sitting enjoying all the dim sums. We're really starting to get busy in here and it's just got a lively atmosphere to it. Everyone's drinking tea, eating dim sum. It's really a nice place to be. So this is our special uh, dessert. These things are crazy, they're like, molten lava custard inside of a bun but actually it's kind of cooled down now because we were filming so it's probably not gonna be too hot oh yeah that's a little disappointing i think it got too cooled down usually it just runs out but it's almost like solidified still nice and sweet and delicious
One thing to note too is that some of the most expensive uh, and Michelin starred restaurants are actually Cantonese restaurants here in Taipei. And actually the only three Michelin star restaurant in Taiwan is a Cantonese restaurant. So they definitely have some really good Cantonese food here. The way that these carts work is they're continuously moving them past the tables, enticing the customers into picking some. You can just pick whatever you want right off of the cart and they'll serve it to you right on the spot. A couple things to note about this place, it's actually 24 seven. So you can enjoy dim sum yum cha all day long, every day. And uh, the tea is unlimited. So don't worry about drinking too much tea. You can sit here all day. So the people at the restaurant were, were really friendly. They saw we were filming and uh, they gave us one of these desserts complimentary. It's got a bunch of taro inside and it's in a coconut milk broth. There's all kinds of other little things, green beans, red beans. There's some lotus seeds. I'm just gonna go in for a big uh, spoonful. And this is a very classic Hong Kong dessert. Mm. So coconutty. Wow, that's so fresh. I love it. It's not sweet really at all. Windows full of hanging roasted meats is a typical sight when walking the streets of Hong Kong. So for lunch, we've come to a place that's serving traditional Cantonese roasted meats. This is the spot right here, so let's order some up. drivers apparently frequent this place quite often. They specialize, of course, in the Cantonese roasted meats. We ordered up a plate of all of their specialties. So the first off is the roasted duck. This is the chashu pork. We've got the pork sausage here, and then we've got the roasted uh, suyuk, the crispy pork belly there. You can see that crispy edge. There's a bunch of vegetables. We get some little uh, fried anchovies here, cucumbers, cabbage, some pickles, a little bit of tofu, but I'm not really interested in that. I'm here for the meat, and I think I gotta start with a piece of the suyuk. It's always my favorite. Oh yeah. It's crispy, it's greasy, oily, fatty, a little bit salty. It's sinfully delicious, but really tasty. Let's try the chashu. You can see that nice red exterior. Mm. Mm. That one's all about the flavor. It's got that honey glaze and it's got a really nice sweetness to it. And I can taste a little bit of like Shaoxing wine, uh, rice wine in there. It's got a little bit of an alcoholic flavor. And next up, sausage. Cantonese meats are definitely leaning on the sweeter side and some foreigners or Westerners might be a little caught off guard by it. Last but not least, we got the crowd favorite, the crispy roast duck. Mm. Oh, that one's not very good. There's absolutely no crunch to that skin. It's very duck flavored and actually the meat is very dry. That one's definitely not my favorite. It's probably the least favorite out of all of them. I'd have to give it up for Shu Yuk number one, probably the sausage number two, and then the chashu. I'm gonna go back for a piece of this Shu Yuk. This is just so good. That crispy layer on the top is ridiculous. It's like pork crackling, just completely crunch, but then disintegrates, melts. I'd have to say flavor-wise, probably not as good as in Hong Kong, but price-wise really makes up for it. Only 150 Taiwan dollars for this whole plate of all kinds of meats, and you definitely can't find a deal like that in Hong Kong. So pretty good though. Next up, we are going for some afternoon tea. There is definitely a strong British influence in Hong Kong. We're gonna tell you a little bit more about that inside our next stop, which is right here behind me. 
你好，单位吗？稍等一下哦。This spot is so cool. It is decorated in everything Hong Kong. There are wallpapers with street scenes from Hong Kong. It's got the memorabilia, all the carnation condensed milk, which is popular in the milk tea. Uh, all of the tables are actually named after the districts in Hong Kong and just very reminiscent, almost nostalgic of like a 80s or 90s scene from Hong Kong with the bright colors, the neon lights. We ordered up some typical dishes for an afternoon tea. I've ordered up the milk tea and it comes in this incredible black and white brand cup, this mug. Oh, I love these so much. You see them all over the place in Hong Kong. If you know where to get one, let me know down in the comment box. I really want one. So milk tea, super popular in Hong Kong. It kind of originates from the colonial period where the British would put milk in their tea and then Hong Kongers wanted to do something similar. So they used condensed milk to put it in their black tea and now you can find it everywhere in Hong Kong. Let's try this one out. Oh yeah, no sugar added yet. I think I'll add a little bit of sugar. It is strong, it is creamy from that condensed milk. Oh, I love it. I love this place. It just feels like we're in Hong Kong. To accompany my milk tea, I've got this monstrous French toast with all of that melted butter and syrup on top. You can see that. So this, this style of dining is uh, cha chan tang, which is a very Western influence type of dining, very simple foods. And this is one of the typical dishes, the French toast. And usually, yeah, it's probably filled with peanut butter. So this thing is just intense. It's gonna be a lot of calories. It's completely fried. Look at that. Holy smokes. Let me try that. Wow. That's a lot. <laughs> This is the opposite of a light dessert. This is a heavy dessert. There's a lot going on there. A lot of bread, a lot of butter, a lot of syrup, and then that peanut butter on the inside is actually quite strong. It's like the main flavor, actually. Very sweet. Um, I'm gonna need Sabrina's help to help finish this. So the only thing that seems reasonable after a long day of eating on this wet and rainy day is to have a hot dessert. So we're heading into our next spot right behind me here. So this place is definitely a little bit more modern than some of the street food places we were visiting today, but it's recommended by Michelin for five years consecutively. It's a typical Hong Kong dessert. This is the hot sesame mixed with walnut and look at just the crazy colors going on there that black sesame and then you get that brown walnut and i'm gonna mix this up a little bit better and that black sesame is just kind of taking over the color here and that is super thick and creamy looking and this is piping hot let me give it a try here. oh yeah oh man it's so strong you can taste that nutty walnut and then it's definitely got a little bit of a sweetness, that sesame flavor, of course, and it's just really creamy and it soothes your throat. Perfect for a nice cold day. Look at that, that is so cool. 